Hi, Jishan. Can you? Oh. Can you hear me, Jishan? Yes, we. Hey, how's it going? Uh, good. Hi, everybody. Hi, Nils. Hey, thanks for coming. How are you? Doing great. Fantastic. It's very early here, like 5 a.m. <laughs> are, you, are you based on the West Coast or? Yes, we are. So it's 5 a.m. in the morning. Literally, yeah. yeah. <laughs> who, who, who chose the, the slot that you? Uh, the, the, the conference uh, organizer, they, they specify the time of the workshop and we, we, we cannot choose. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for me, it's convenient 2 p.m. in the afternoon. Yeah. Yeah, if we were physically there, it would still be okay. It would still be, it would yeah. still be convenient, but yeah. <laughs> Next think. year, maybe. I think uh, the idea that they try to pick it uh, is the Montreal time, uh, Montreal local time, because the conference is supposed to happen, was supposed to happen uh, in Montreal. So what time is it in Montreal? Uh, it is plus three, a plus three hours, so it is uh, okay. 8 a.m. in the morning. Okay, still, still quite an ambitious time for a Sunday. Yes. <laughs> I think it's good to have you have the first speaker because uh, it can be <laughs> I'm the only one who is awake already. Okay. Most of the people <laughs> are on the West Coast actually uh, in the same time zone with us, with me in season. Absolutely, we can we can maybe wait for two more minutes and then I can spend five minutes just, just making some introduction and then Nils can go. Jamal, are you are you able to see your chat? I'm, I'm trying. To, I'm trying to send you some message, Jamal. Um, I can see. Yep, I can see the chat. Yep. Fantastic. Um, sounds sounds good with me. Okay. Nils, did you, did, you, did you did you invent the term cognitive augmented reality? I, I've never... I'm not sure if, if inventing is. I mean, I I think it's. I'm. I might be the most um, frequent user. I I cannot say whether I'm 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 the inventor of it. At least. Um. I mean, I've I have authored a paper uh, with yeah. this title. Um, it was the, the claim of the startup um, and basically it will also be covered in the talk so you can yeah, oh, yeah. Um, appreciate it fantastic maybe, maybe I can start in one minute Wait, is that okay yeah sure so I, I think you, you can uh, <clears throat> I 
Okay, I I, I can uh, I, I can just in, uh, make a little bit of an introduction to what what we are doing here today uh, early Sunday morning. Uh, so uh, I'm Zishan. Uh, I, I'm one of the organizers. Uh, and uh, and I work for a startup called Retrocausal. Uh, Kwok Hui Tran and Andre Konen are my other two colleagues. We we also uh, you know we all all work for a startup called Retrocausal, where we build computer vision systems to help factory workers become more efficient. Uh, my other uh, co-organizers are Jamal Afridi. He's a computer vision data scientist at 3M, the manufacturing giant, and. Uh, uh, and, and then Gaurav Sharma, who's a, a, a visiting assistant professor at IIT Kanpur. Uh, he used to be a research scientist at NEC Labs America up until recently. And uh, we saw that computer vision had, you know, computer vision was one of, or manufacturing was one of the first use cases to computer vision for, for computer vision that we had heard of during our first computer vision lectures. We know that, that a company called Cognex was one of the first companies, was one of the first commercial applications of computer vision for Cognex was founded like 40 years ago by one of the, uh, you know, early contributors to deep learning. So that, that's, that's kind of where it all started. My own undergraduate studies in Munich were funded by a company called MV Tech, GmbH uh, that spun out of Technical University of Munich, right? Again, again, focusing on visual defect detection on the factory floor. But, but more recently, we saw a lot of applications, uh, a lot of custom systems that were being built by IoT, uh, IoT engineers uh, that could very well be built, have been built by computer vision engineers. For instance, I visited a factory in Cleveland, Ohio, where I was seeing uh, these engineers had built custom designed for half a million dollars. And over 18 months, these systems were, which could mistake proof up an assembly process. So they were, they were LED based sensors. And when you passed your hand through a bin, it would detect that you were about to pick up this part or that part. And if you were, if the worker was about to pick a wrong part, the system would go, no, no, you're, you're picking up the wrong part. And then you picked up that part and picked, put it in front of a Cognix camera and the system would say, okay, yeah, you assemble the right product, right? We, we thought that we could probably uh, if, if we were using computer vision for those kinds of systems, you could probably bring down the cost by 100x and probably also build these systems by 100x faster. We were also seeing applications in ergonomics and safety and so on and so forth, where you know people, people outside of computer vision, instrumentation engineers, quality engineers, industrial engineers were building their own custom solutions. So we thought that we'd collect people from within the computer vision community and, and look at some of these problems, especially invite leaders from com within computer vision uh, who have been looking at these kinds of problems for a long time. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of young blood coming into computer vision. Maybe we can direct some of that towards, towards manufacturing problems where, where a, a lot of contribution to the society can be made. I'll, I'll stop here. So, so we have, uh, we've been fortunate to have some, uh, you know, very senior people in computer vision that look at manufacturing and, and, and uh, you know, nearby fields like warehousing and so on. We've been very fortunate at that. Our first speaker is Nils Peterson. Uh, he did his PhD from the Technical University of Kaiserslautern, was uh, headed a research group at, at the German Institute for AI uh, called Cognitive Augmented Reality, founded a startup called IOXP. I, I, I presume he'll talk about that, ran it for five years, and, and then basically uh, got acquired, which, which ended up getting acquired by Qualcomm. Uh, so, sorry, ended up getting acquired by PTC. And, and now he's a senior director there, uh, building augmented reality to help frontline workers on the factory floor and beyond be more effective. So I'll, I'll uh, you know, transfer it to Nils to, you know, take, take it away and, and tell us something more about it. Thanks. Thank you very much for the introduction. So the uh, notorious question, can everybody see my screen? Yep. And hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay. So, um, hi, thanks for having me. Thanks for the introduction. This uh, basically takes away my first uh, three slides, but, um, so as you can take from my title, I will speak about how to use computer vision and AI 
to improve AR work instructions in some meaningful way. Um, still uh, a quick introduction to myself. So I, I started at the uh, German Research Center for Artificial Intelligence um, on research um, towards AI usage or AI driven step-by-step -step assistance. Um, had um, a couple of disseminations, a couple of prototypes, and then a couple of industrial pilots already in that phase. Um, and then uh, founded a startup to commercialize on, on um, this research. Um, this, at least in the German region, has um, created quite a lot of buzz, actually. So we have had been in, in several um, national um, TV outlets, in print media, um, had a couple of innovation awards um, and research awards. And I don't know if you still recognize Angela Merkel, but we were selected one of four innovation exhibits for the digital summit, which is like the national um, summit where future um, IT and industry directions are presented to, to a general audience and of course to, 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 to politics. Um, so last year we've been acquired by PTC and um, are bringing what what we what we did at IOXP to the lineup of Euphoria, which is like the AR lineup of PTC, being one of the industry leaders in AR. In fact, um, just just a note: um, if you plan um, to to uh, to to give your career uh, a twist, uh, we are actually hiring in Vienna, Zurich, and Mannheim where the computer vision departments are uh, located. All right, so what, we, what did we actually do? Let me show you this example of Bosch um, uh, in, in Mannheim. So basically there we use stationary tablets or head-worn devices um, to guide a worker through a series of more or less complex tasks, tinting the hands green if they were doing it all right, and tinting the hands red if the movement or something was implausible. And most importantly, check marking each and every step um, and, and validating the correctness of each and every step in real time immediately after it was done. Um, so this, this video obviously was slowed down to, to meet basically the, the pace of my narration. Let me show you it in real time. Hand is green, everything is okay. And immediately after it's done, it's checkmarked. So basically the correctness of the step is being validated by the system. And the next instruction, which is basically this text label here, is presented to the user automatically. So this is not static work instructions anymore. The user did not, did not need to decide for themselves whether the step was completed correctly, um, but the system checked that, understood that now the next work instruction is due and offered that proactively to the user, basically catering to the information needs of the user um, and um, building for a, for a much more uh, fluid um, user experience when receiving work instructions and um, with the goal basically of, of producing flawless outcome, like Zishan basically uh, motivated in his introduction. <clears throat> And one very important aspect of it is everything you've seen in this example, except for the, the, the textual descriptions, had been, um, had been purely um, learned from observing reference recordings of this workflow. And um, by its time, it was, um, to the best of my knowledge, the, the world's first capture-driven AR solution and um, basically could, could deal with more or less arbitrary recordings with a single constraint that the workers needed to, to basically focus their gaze on the, on the area of inter, inter, uh, interaction during the conduction of each action. Then they could move again, but, but they, they needed to have everything in focus. So they, they, they weren't allowed to look at their watch and then, then look back at the scene. Um, from that, Basically, we um, the, the system inferred the, the task boundaries of the comprising task by, by classifying on, on some self-similarity cues, or we simply ask the author where each step starts and stops. And with this um, information about, about the temporal structure of this recording, 
We then looked into each and every single snippet, looked where the users are interacting, are they pulling a plug, are they removing a component, what's the state of the environment before and after each work step, and then also um, building a rough 3D map of the environment. And with this structural information and this at least superficial understanding of the task goals, it's quite straightforward to then extract meaningful descriptive video snippets from the source material and using the 3D map, um, stabilize it onto, um, um, uh, onto the environment, completing basically the entire pipeline from, um, from video recording to fully working AR step-by-step -step documentation. Um, so if we go one step back, basically, um, what AR work instructions or, or even AR experience in general are being created, um, they always follow this, obviously, I mean, this, I mean, it's not rocket science what I show here, but the, the takeaway message is you, you have some input, maybe um, video recordings, and then typically in AR, you only care about the spatial information contained in this, in this video material. And then in authoring, you add some, some textual description or some, some meaningful augmentations. And during runtime, you again only care about um, the position of the camera. So you only exploit um, spatial cues from the user. But this is not what you've seen in the opening example. And this is the first characteristics of cognitive AR. Um, you exploit a much richer channel, um, not only exploiting spatial cues, but also looking at the interaction and providing feedback on the interaction. So the, the, the green tinting of the, the hands and um, environmental state, um, which is feedback in feed fed back in terms of the, um, the, the real-time um, uh, correctness validation. And since, especially for, um, for video recordings in AR, you have a very neat property. And that is that your, your video recordings typically look exactly like the, the video feed during runtime that you actually intend to decode. So you can, can do a very elegant shortcut um, by basically um, using the runtime as your, as your additional input and thereby coming to the, the, the closed loop of cognitive AR, where during runtime, we learn from demonstration using camera recordings. And um, during authoring, we exploit the already available instructions that were intended for a human audience, basically. So they are not, no technical instructions, but we, we try to use whatever was meant for the, the human audience. So, um, ideally, we are able basically to, to um, uh, extract training data for this rich experience with zero or very little additional effort for the users and the authors. Um, so since we've uh, come to PTC, um, we are obviously also interested in merging it with the capabilities of the Vuporia lineup and they are very, very good in cat-based tracking. So um, let me show you what they can do. So here we, they can recognize and initialize from arbitrary viewing viewpoints um, different components using, using the same trained model. And um, not only are they able to initialize several components, but they can also, what you will see in this part here, they are also able to apply this capability to to track through um, an assembly sequence, sustaining the tracking despite drastic change of the interaction object. Um, so on one side, it sustains tracking. On the other side, this can also be used for this feedback to basically provide the suitable information at the right time, like we've seen in the introductory example. However, um, since CAT models typically are not photorealistic, they, um, yeah, intrinsically work on, on geometric cues. So basically on edge cues or on, 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 on surface gradient cues. And, and therefore, if you have very, very tiny details in the scene, um, they typically are difficult to uh, infer from, from cat data alone. 
And there, basically, our approach comes into play. So um, this, the result basically looks like that. So this uses the same tracking method. And uh, in this example, we would like to validate the presence of these screws. In this video, we are very close by, but um, you can imagine, I mean, those are really tiny screws. Um, if you if you move further away, basically the um, the difference between um, the socket and the screw head themselves do not differ so much in terms of the um, geometry around it, but basically it's this reflectance properties that basically um, um, facilitate um, a robust classification. So let me show you what it does. Basically here, the tracker is initialized and then the system says, yeah, the, the screw is present, everything is all right. Um, so what, what would happen if I intentionally remove the screw causing an error? Basically, as soon as I enter the scene, the system let me do it. So as soon as I enter the screen, the scene, the, the system would notice, oh no, at the moment it's occluded, I cannot infer the state. As soon as I show the, the target area again, it says, no, this is not a correct state. So please, um, please fix it again. So I'm, if I was an industry worker, I would be um, immediately able to, to, to fix it again. And um, while moving through the rest of the sequence, basically, be supported um, to just leave a flawless outcome behind me. Um, um, and this obviously would then work for the, the large scale changes that are also detectable from CAD data alone. And for these miniature or, or even, even changes just in texture space um, that, um, are best learned from appearance data. So um, when coming back to this low effort cognitive AR closed loop, this works as follows. Um, this is what basically uh, an author using this system um, would, would, would see and use. So this is the Vuforia editor. The application that you've seen is Vuforia Instruct. Um, so in the Vuforia editor, uh, the, the author would enter some, some, some textual description and place some 3D marker in, on the 3D object. And uh, it's safe to assume that this 3D marker area has something to do with the correctness of the step. So basically during runtime, the system would look close by the, um, the position of this marker. And after a couple, after having observed um, some of the workers' decisions, whether this is um, pass or fail. Again, this is the, the off-the-shelf application as, as, as you can purchase it by, uh, from PTC. Um, after, after observing a couple of examples here, it can close down to the vicinity of the actual changes here and then, then train the classifier using these extracted patches, um, incorporating CAT data and incorporating, obviously, appearance data. Okay, so the, the real beauty of it, obviously, is uh, when you apply it to more, more complex situations. So here we have a more complex object. And in the first step, um, this, the user is asked to check the tubing. It's in the wrong state. So after I insert the tube or the pipe, um, it's validated correctly. And um, one neat property, that's why I pause it here, is that this pipe here is not part of the original CAD model. And even if it was, it, it would be very hard since it's a flexible component and, and requires special treatment. It's no rigid object. It's, it's notoriously hard to uh, model with CAD information, but um, using this um, combination of CAD and appearance-based training, it's, it's, it's very straightforward and, and basically follows the same um, low effort closed loop as you've seen in the previous slide. And basically you can, yeah, you can extend it to cases like that. Also, oh, sorry, I would like to show you quickly the rest of the video. Um, so check marked as soon as it's inserted. Then if you move to the next situation, you can see this um, rather small screw heads again, 
Um, we've, we've seen this application um, also before. And um, the strength of the cat tracking, of course, is played out when the user is then guided, in, like in the next step, guided to the rear of, um, of this object with a very stable tracking. And here, basically, you, uh, you should, in, in, in fact, plug this connector here. Again, not part of the CAT model and uh, nicely covered by this approach as well. All those examples basically have in common that um, the, the correctness can be, dis can be uh, um, uh, discerned from a single example image. So no matter how small, and this is a realistic example, no matter how small the, the detail is, you can say from a single image, is the screw head present or is it not present? So um, this category is, is when, when you have a um, distinguishable target state after the step. Um, but not all steps follow this um, principle. Um, so basically here, when you add this um, circuit board here, it's not only important to have it placed on top of it, but it's also important to not have it tilted slightly. So basically um, at the end of the step, the, the worker should press it down evenly, um, which basically doesn't change this, this camera view that we are seeing here at all anymore. Um, so we have to think about something different. And also when we look at the opening industry example, in this sequence alone, or in this procedure alone, there have been four steps that are indistinguishable by its target state. And the, the rightmost one, where the worker needs to remove a spacer disk using a magnet, is even the most quality crucial. Because as you can imagine, if, if the outcome is not obvious or, or even visible, then it's, it's very easy to forget this step also for the, for the worker. So there's a, a drastic use case for that. And, um, and the approach is, um, of course, to not look at the outcome, but look at the conduction instead. So instead of training a network um, on a single image, we trained them on the actual conduction of the recognition network. Um, we started this work in RxP, but only now basically we, we, are, <laughs> we are so happy with the results that, that we would like to, to show them. So basically for this example, we trained it with examples that looked somewhat like this. And um, for a different class, we showed it examples that looked somewhat like that. And um, here is one of the outcomes. What you, what you see here is basically the, the raw input footage. At the top left, you see basically the raw classifier output just in a human readable form. So, so um, class zero is just, just no action, so, so basically put in a human readable form. And um, for the correct state, there's a, there's a timer. So you have to, to be in the correct state for three seconds. That's, that's what you see here. So let's roll this. So basically, if I do erratic motion on top of this camera, then it can say, hey, what are you doing? This, is, this doesn't make sense. Um, but worse than doing um, nonsensical work is doing it intentionally wrong. Um, basically transferring the moisture of my fingertips onto the delicate electronics. Um, and only if I do it correctly as intended, then after three seconds, um, it says, yes, continue pushing and then step completed. Well done. And another example, and this is particularly um, nice because um, this use case here where you have to check on the cable connection would not support traditional um, uh, object tracking because as you see when you when you want to check on it you 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 grab for it so you, you occlude most of it it's not enough to look at it from all sides it's also not enough to to just i don't know wave or or touch the the cable somehow you really have to to bend and pull it to um, figure it out and then the system says yes well tested um, so this is um, for a lot of real world um, inspection cases, um, checking cable connectors or checking clips or checking spurs or um, cracks or something with, with 
by bare hand inspection of surfaces is a very real world use case. And this is a nice approach towards it. Um, so to conclude, basically, just, just on the uh, industrial application of this, um, if we look at an uh, industry worker, um, what, what does he need to get enabled for his work? Um, obviously, you need some, some process documentation. You need some way to, to train this process to the, to the worker. And you need some way to, to check for the quality of the output. And in today's factories, this is done in the following way. Um, so typically, you still it's still state of the art to just have a monitor displaying a PDF file with uh, work instructions. And for the first couple of hours or even days, you, the, the new worker gets shadowed by a, a more experienced worker uh, to, to basically um, to, to, to guide him one by one. And we can improve on that since basically the system knows more about the worker. It can provide a really high, highly personalized training for new workers. And um, since um, the component can be detected, even without having this information from the auto list can instruct on complex and highly variant assembly uh, procedures. Um, Typically, um, the uh, documentation is an editorial process in the back end. Um, you can improve that by augmenting the process with um, documentation input from observation. And one of the main advantages here is that your um, training material, therefore, is always in sync by design because you need to perform it that way to document it. So no more outdated training material after, after the first, uh, I don't know, process update, which actually occurs quite often in, in factory lines. And maybe the, the most important aspect, um, end of line inspection, um, those notorious quality gates are um, potentially not able to, to catch all errors um, after they are hidden by, by more layers or, or they are hard to fix. So we can improve that by in process inspection. It's very natural to use the camera and the understanding of the step-by-step -step process to really do atomic level testing after e each and every work step and therefore produce instant fault alerts um, to just rework and not produce crap. That is it. Thank you. And um, I'm happy if we have time for questions to hear them. Does anybody have questions? Uh, if you could raise your hands or put them in the chat box. Uh, we could, uh, we, we still have actually plenty of time for Q and A. I, 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 I actually have some questions, Nils. One is, do you see this more as a, as a training tool? As uh, you know, where, where you tra help train new workers do you see this more as, as something that, that they use on a repetitive, you know, on a shift long basis? Maybe you showed some uh, assembly examples. Would somebody be using this all day long? Mm, I mean, if they, I mean, the, the user interfaces that I've shown are typically the ones that you would use to onboard new workers. Um, for all day long use cases, typically the workers, um, are if if it's a if it's a um, a tacted workplace, typically the tech times are like nine seconds or fifteen seconds. So there's no no time to to look at uh, AR work instructions or, or or read text or anything, and you are more distracted by this monitor. So basically, the 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 underlying system remains the same. However, the the um, the presentation side of it typically only shows the the worker dashboard. Um, that is not in AR, but just shows order list or whatever they are used to at the moment. And then the system would only alert the worker if they deviate from the, um, from the process. And then you would have the possibility to, to react in some meaningful way. Since, I mean, you, in theory, you could, you could basically anticipate all typical errors in a procedure and, and pre-author meaningful recovery strategies in AR to guide them back. Um, but but it would be a reactive display, not a not a permanent one. 
Got it. Appreciate that. So Khuram is is saying, uh, do you use activity detection models by detecting hand motion uh, positions, or is it more of using object detection, th detecting hand poses? Yeah, it's 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 direct. I mean, in the beginning, uh, in the IOXP era, and um, since basically I started with three um, D hand detection in the era before um, uh, RGBD cameras, so it was a basically when 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 it was a, was a challenge still, and therefore the work was heavily influenced by basically first um, detecting um, the hand posture and work with that. Now basically it's 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 deep learning, so it's 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 starting with the pixels and ending with the class label of correct or wrong. There's no no layered approach. First, uh, getting the hand position and then um, discerning it. Fantastic. And James uh, James Steer is asking: Can it identify the number of turns of a screw or or, or depth? I mean, typically. I mean, typically, I would I would argue not using cameras um, because typically those would not use screwdrivers to to uh, to pull the screw, but they would have basically even 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 torque measuring electric screwdrivers. So so the typical approach is that you connect with the um, PLC and um, you uh, get at least the activation or even the, the maximum torque of the screwdriver. So you would align that with the information that the screwdriver was, was placed on top of the correct screw. And, and the information whether it was activated, very, very hard to see from all perspectives. The, the system has its, its greatest charm if um, the, the camera viewpoint can be rather um, flexible. So um, we are not intending to immediately compete with with industrial computer vision system like Cognix, like you you, you mentioned Cognix. I mean they they have their place, and um, um, here basically the charm is to have a flexible camera system um, that could even go so far that that you have even a head mounted um, system. Therefore, you cannot observe all things. Especially not if 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 it's just just the ro rotations of an electric screwdriver. Quite appreciate it. So uh, uh, we'll take one more question from Khurram, which is: What type of hardware is used to run these deep learning models, and if whether you do any model op optimizations to make these run in real time? I mean, to to train the networks, that's not real time. Real time. That's um, in in fact even even queued up to basically uh, have a more consistent load on the on the on the clusters that, that deal with uh, uh, with the training efforts um, the runtime then is real time and um, runs on commodity hardware so so this obviously runs on on, on um, the the examples that you've seen um, were running on a uh, on an android tablet um, um, so runtime is um, is off is on device and real time. Got it. Uh, I, I will take one last question. Actually, it's from Hamza. From for different work sites, do you train build the whole model system, or sorry, uh, sorry, can you, you, can you create the data set and training for every different different scenario from scratch? Um, <laughs> in fact, at the moment, yes. Um, and and uh, in the in the future, obviously, we we want to we want to investigate the um, possibility to to have off the shelf classifiers. But in fact, um, this is also one of the core strengths of the system. So so typically, AI applications have some clever pre-trained approach. It's 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 not not the most typical approach to to have an to have classifiers trained with customer provided data on a case by case basis. Um, so um, being able to do that and um, optimizing the effortless of the, of the experience for, for the people that provide the data. So for the users, for the authors, for the workers um, is, is basically the thing that we concentrate at the moment. 
And then with, with that given the, the possibility to have um, a dedicated classifier per case is, is in fact even, even a strength of the approach. All right, thanks Nils. Uh, and I'll transfer it over to Hui, but if you could take, Priya Kansal asks, what if the camera is installed at a distant position? And then we'll transfer answer over to Hui. If, if the camera is placed at a disti distant position, then, um, I mean, it, it depends. I mean, in, in, in practice, basically, this means you, you have to use an industrial camera with, with suitable optics. So, so we had use cases in the industry where the camera was mounted on the, on the roof of the, of the, not the factory hall, but the, uh, the scaffolding. I'm, I'm not sure if it's the right term for it, but um, it, was, it was like, like six meters away from, from the actual inspection point, And you just use optics that zoom in. Um, but um, I guess the, the question is if the, um, if the training approach could handle it. And I mean, if, if basically the tracker would be able to, 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 get a, um, to get a lock on the object, then it's, it's just whether the pixels contain the information because I'm, I'm very confident that the networks would be able to, um, uh, to learn the, the difference then. Fantastic. Thanks a lot, Nils. Uh, really appreciate your time. Hui, Hui, take it away. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, so uh, I am happy to introduce our next speaker, uh, we, uh, Dr. Uh, Jamo Abidi. So he currently a data scientist and chair of uh, computer vision chapter at 3M Corporation. He obtained his PhD degree in computer vision from Michigan State University in uh, 2016 and has been with uh, 3M since then. Uh, Jamal, uh, I think you can take over now. Thanks, Hui. Um, so let me share my screen. Okay. All right. Okay, I'm assuming you can see the screen. Yep. Okay, cool. So hello, everyone. Um, so you mentioned I'm Jamal. And uh, in this talk, I will talk about uh, computer vision and how it relates to different manufacturing contexts. Uh, we will see that in one manufacturing context, uh, there would be a number of computer vision solutions available, whereas in the other manufacturing context, uh, there may be more challenges and is a less addressed area. So at the end of this talk, I will also show you some interesting demos of the 3M manufactured films. Uh, these are basically some transparent films. And when you put them on a camera, uh, it actually would allow your camera to see very clearly despite being in environments where vision is not clear. Um, but before we get into all of that discussion, uh, let's first develop some understanding and discussion around these different type of manufacturing processes and manufacturing contexts. And then later on, we will relate this understanding and uh, this discussion to applying computer vision in them. So uh, here in this talk, I'll be talking mainly based on my experience, uh, which comes from working in 3M, which is a global manufacturing company. And uh, 3M actually wasn't always a big manufacturing company. Um, it more than 100 years ago, it actually started as a small two floor building in Minnesota. Uh, now, after 100 years, it has 3M has many factories across the United States. And in fact, we are not only manufacturing at the national level, but also across the world. We have manufacturing plants in 37 different countries. And many of these plants have some type of computer vision solutions installed in them. So now within 3M, um, I work in the corporate research labs that are based at the 3M headquarters in St. Paul, Minnesota. I'm currently also the chair of the 3M computer vision chapter there and um, also the product owner of a computer vision team. Uh, for my educational background, as you mentioned, I have PhD in computer science that focuses on computer vision. And uh, recently, I've also started pursuing an MBA degree from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. 
So working in corporate research labs, uh, we interact with many 3M divisions that make a wide range of products. And um, I, do want to, I do want to highlight one thing that in contrast to many other companies, we actually manufacture our products ourselves. We own the plants, we own the land, we own the material, almost everything about it. So after joining 3M, I realized 3M manufactures a lot of products in these plants. Actually, more than 50,000 different products, ranging from consumer products like uh, Scotch Bright, Post-it Notes, uh, to personal safety products, which include N95 respirators, to ear protection devices, to a wide range of healthcare and food safety products. And now let me tell you, these are only a few products from only about four different 3M divisions. 3M actually has more than 20 different divisions making all these 50,000 different products. Now, what, what you may be imagining is that these are very different products which may require very different manufacturing lines or processes, and that's right. So now when we think of computer vision inspecting these products or computer vision inspecting these processes, there could be a need of very different types of computer vision approaches to handle the correspondingly different manufacturing contexts. Um, now to understand these contexts, I first <clears throat> wanted to understand uh, on a high level picture of what's happening on a factory floor. So during my time at 3M, I visited a number of different factories, especially those in the Midwest area in the US. And what I see is happening on the factory floor in the context of manufacturing was an interaction between three different entities, which are all interconnected. So products uh, that come out of a manufacturing process go through an inspection system, where many times a computer vision-based system is installed. Now, based on the results of this computer vision system, two potential changes could happen. Number one, the parameters of the manufacturing process may automatically be changed, of course, to improve the quality of the product. And number two, human experts could be alerted. So human experts could be alerted to see, to see the inspection results and uh, then take an effective action so that the process again, the process so that the process could be improved to make a better quality products again. These computer vision inspection systems uh, represents one of the key elements, I would say, where computer vision really has a very strong play. Now, let's discuss these processes first, and then based on that understanding, we will better relate computer vision inspection systems in more detail in the relationship to the context. So the scope of this talk, we will focus on computer vision for two different types of manufacturing processes. That is discrete manufacturing, and continuous manufacturing. So what's the difference between the two? Uh, when manufacturing process, let's say, results in products like uh, that could be individually counted, right, as separate units, then you're talking about discrete manufacturing. I would say examples would include uh, processes that produce light bulbs, cars, laptops. Um, so each laptop or car is a separate individual unit, and therefore we can count the number of laptops or cars being produced. Now, in contrast, the product coming out of a continuous manufacturing process is very finely divisible and may be measured in volume and not in counts. So as long as you keep providing ingredients to the process, you can keep producing a volume of paper, volume of film, polymer, and that's continuous manufacturing. Now, one interesting thing to note is that uh, most of the times when, when I've heard people talking about uh, computer vision in manufacturing, it is mostly in the space of discrete manufacturing where we already have many solutions and it is a populated area. So I've noticed that the computer vision challenges in this continuous manufacturing space are much less addressed and that's a very challenging area. A large manufacturing company like 3M has to focus heavily on this continuous manufacturing space because it has to enable the production of materials, which actually is required for manufacturing a number of different products across the world. So, however, as I mentioned, there are much less commercially available solutions in the continuous context. 
Now, now let's bring all this discussion from these few slides together into a single image. And we see this. So for me, what I have here is the overall picture that shows products coming out of both discrete and continuous manufacturing processes, and then going to an in inspection process where a computer vision system may be there. Now here is where it starts becoming uh, interesting. In the context of uh, automated computer vision-based systems, discrete manufacturing, static image analysis, or static scan analysis is usually a dominant computer vision solution. The camera can take a picture of a discrete product and the algorithm can tell you if there is a defect in it. Uh, now, you can use this information in many ways. For example, how many defected products were there in each batch or temporally, how your defected products increased over time. So again, as I mentioned, this is a context that's heavily populated with commercial solutions. And uh, in this talk, I'll also show you some examples. So here is one example in the context of how we use this analysis in discrete manufacturing. So every time a product is produced in discrete manufacturing context, you may want to print something on it before it is available to the customer, right? Consider the example of license plates. Once you have a license plate, you may want to print a pattern on each plate based on the requirement. Now, the demand for uh, the quality and consistency of printing is usually very high. So we need a vision-based inspection system to inspect each print on the plate. So that's one example. Of course, we want such systems to be accurate in finding classifying defects, um, but we also want such systems to be very uh, fast as well. Second, I will also mention that such systems may have to handle a very large variety of defects. I'm showing some of these here. Um, on the left, you can see the missing ink problem, for example. Uh, then in the next image, we see small dents as defects that need to be picked by the algorithm. There are also streaks in some cases, as you can see in this middle image. And uh, sometimes we may detect contaminations as well. The rightmost image shows a bridging issue where the alphabets T and H are actually supposed to be separate. Um, now, now, there are a wide range of uh, computer vision solutions in, in this space that could be leveraged to address the defect detection in this context. Um, for example, there are solutions in the industry that present a template matching based approach toward this problem. You can have a reference template for each pattern and then match products against it. So these solutions are very fast, but in some cases, these, approach, these approaches face some challenges, um, especially in differentiating acceptable parts from, for the customer from the unacceptable parts. Um, now, on the other hand, our factory engineers have noticed that deep learning based approaches does a really more accurate job in differentiating the acceptable parts from the unacceptable ones for the customer. Again, I'm, I'm only showing a unit like architecture here, which can highlight or segment a defective part, but also imagine the use of multi-class classification architectures and other architectures as well. So many times we have observed that deep learning solutions identify defect severity in the same way as the human eye. And that's interesting. Um, but in some cases, specifically those related to multi-class defect scenarios, uh, it was also hard to interpret why a specific part was called defective. So let me share an example here. Um, on the left is a reference template here. Uh, in the middle is what comes out of the template may matching. Of course, after passing it through some post-processing steps, which are conducted in order to suppress the noise. Uh, now the question is, are the highlighted regions in the red in this middle image good enough to call this as a defected part? Maybe, maybe not. So uh, it will depend on the customer. Okay, now the rightmost image represents the result from why a deep learning based approach called this as a defected product. Now it's interesting that it correctly highlights a small but an important area that could actually be a reason for this part, uh, for, for, this, for the dejection of this part. 
So in template matching, we somehow lost this very small region while suppressing the noise. Uh, here is another example for inspection in discrete manufacturing. On the left is a medical product with multiple micro needles in it. To inspect such products, we may be throwing light at this product from a specific direction. And what that does is it creates shadows. And then we do shape analysis on these shadows using traditional computer vision techniques to inspect the quality of these micro needles. Okay. Um, so, so far, what we have discussed was a discrete manufacturing where static image-based solutions play a dominant role. Um, we, there is also spatial temporal analysis in discrete manufacturing, but that, that relates more to the process analysis, like assembly, not specifically to the products. So, and, but we also discussed that this is comparatively a more populated area. Now, when it comes to continuous manufacturing or most dominant needs may have to be addressed using spatial temporal analysis. And again, this is an area that provides a number of challenges, is much less addressed for manufacturing needs, but is one of the most heavily used area of manufacturing. Uh, so significantly impacting this continuous manufacturing area could be a big deal. Um, again, as a reminder, when we talk about continuous manufacturing, it is different than discrete because here the product is finely divisible and may be measured by volume rather than by counts. So something to keep in mind. Some examples would include paper production, film production, even polymers. Um, here is a video from one of our uh, three implants that shows a transparent film being continuously manufactured in Rome. These films have special characteristics uh, which are then used in the making of many other products across the world. What's important to note here is that when you're continuously producing film uh, especially at a very high speed when you're doing that, anomalies and defects uh, would be of temporal nature. So what looks like an anomaly in one moment may vanish in the next moment. And uh, in, that, in some cases, it can be completely harmless, and that's okay. Now, some of these defects could amplify over time and create issues. And in some other cases, these may vanish, but they are too important of a defect to ignore. So sometimes the location actually to which the anomalies could spread over time, that's also important. So usually what happens is if a human expert is looking at this phenomena, they have to look at it for a while to make a pass fail decision on the product. Now, if we have to put a camera uh, to monitor the production of these, these films, we will have a spatial temporal video as data. And, and now in this continuous manufacturing space, I, I do wanna mention one thing that I could not talk about the exact 3M applications in public on this. But what we can do here is, is to hypothesize a video volume and then discuss the technical characteristics of the problem and, and corresponding challenges. So let's first discuss the data characteristics. Here we usually get a very high frame rate video uh, because the speeds are sometimes really high. So we need a very high rate frame rate camera to capture that. And most of the times these frame rate values are above 100. Uh, the image's resolution could be, say, more than uh, 1,200 by 1,200. And within these, we may be looking for very small defect features, which could evolve in time. And you may have to come up with models that can process these videos very fast. By the way, if you're thinking about resizing uh, the large image size, that doesn't help because the feature sizes we are interested in are pretty small, so you may lose information on them. So one, one, one thing you can see here is that it's uh, not like one of those publicly available data sets many times uh, with very small clips, uh, large features and nice labels where you can um, apply a standard computer vision uh, or a standard video classification network and get high accuracy. Um, here, um, I would also mention what, what makes these data sets more interesting is that there could be multiple events happening within a short time. So for example, a needle can come in and start operating on the product. And in a few moments, you may see vibrations due to motor movement. Uh, similarly, there could be um, other events that could happen very quickly in a short time. And all of that is happening, as I mentioned, really quickly. At the end, I, I would also mention that these video units, if you, if you have to divide them or to think about classifying video volumes, um, the unit may comprise of more than 2000 plus frame and, and the spatial resolution is pretty high. So this is about the data characteristics. Um, 
So we, we just previously talked about the data characteristics and um, that are collected in a continuous manufacturing setting. Here, we want to understand the labeling challenges in that context, right? So here, just like in the medical industry, labeling has to be performed by an expert. In, in medical industry, you have to have a doctor or a medical expert look at the data. Here, you have to have an expert actually to look at the, the, the data for you and then actually correctly label it. So it's not like you can just put your data online and then anyone can annotate cats, dogs, or cars in it for you. It is, it is especially tedious because an expert has to look at the whole video of potential defects and then make a pass-fail decision about the product. And based on observing, this is usually based on observing the spatial temporal nature of these defects, right? Um, one thing that we need to see is that usually the label I get from the expert is a global label on the whole video. So for example, here I'm showing uh, it as a category A, or you can call it a good or a bad product. What I do not get most of the times is where exactly are some important features appearing or disappearing in a video. If the labeling expert has time, I may get some extra labels about what, I, what are the type of things that happened in the video. So usually I would end up having a overall global label and some weak labels uh, that tells me what happened, but not exactly where these things happened, right? Um, so by the way, in, in this manufacturing setting, uh, you may get a lot of unlabeled data though. So it's, it's the labeling that's time consuming and it's, that's expensive. Uh, but because of an expert time is required, as I mentioned, the label data that you'll get probably would be limited. Uh, now, so far we discussed the data characteristics of the videos that are collected in a continuous manufacturing setting, and also discussed the nature of lab labeling that is performed on these. Now, beyond these technical characteristics and challenges, there are some general overall challenges uh, for computer vision and manufacturing that we experience. So for example, number one, data collection is observational. That means you cannot just go and stop the line or start the line because you want to create a very nice balanced good data set. So you, what happens is you can just observe and collect whatever is happening on the floor. That's so it's an observational approach here. Second, label data set may be limited, but variety and diversity of potential recipes is very high. That means with limited label data, your approach may face some challenges in generalizing to other recipes, right? The third thing I would highlight here is that um, there could be variations in the collected data from plant to plant, from line to line, uh, viewpoints could be different, cameras could be different. So all that has to be kept into the context. And uh, importantly, the fourth one is interpretability. This is very important. So factory engineers and experts working on the factory floor, they do want to know why algorithm is calling something defected. Uh, so that's really important too. Okay, um, now next, I am going to talk about a topic that I find very interesting. So 3M manufacturers, uh, films and some of these have very interesting properties to significantly impact computer vision systems. You may put these films, as I mentioned at the start, on a camera lens or on the object of interest. And uh, what it will do is it will make your vision systems robust to some environment changes, irrespective of whether you're using discrete manufacturing or you're using continuous manufacturing. So in the next few slides, I will show an interesting demo of one of the films. Uh, now let's first understand what do these films really do to impact a computer vision system. What usually may happen in computer vision system is that you have a camera or a vision sensor that senses the environment, right? Say in a factory setting or um, that could, in, or maybe in any other general environment that could result in giving the algorithm some visual frames. For algorithm, I've written deep learning here, but you can imagine other computer vision algorithms too. Um, as a result, what happens is the algorithm finally develops some understanding about the situation in a factory or how it is performing, right? So that's the standard way. Now, what these films do, what these films do is that once you put them on a camera, it can significantly improve the quality of information captured about a process in a factory or about environment they're used in even when the vision is not 
clear in some scenarios. So once you have better information, the algorithm could provide you better understanding of the situation, right? So one example of such dream films are SPFs, or call it uh, sensor protection films, which could provide visibility uh, to monitor manufacturing processes, even in the presence of vapors or falling water droplets. Um, here, I will not publicly be sharing an exact manufacturing example, but let's see the demo in of the film in the context of automobile industry. So um, in this demo, you see a patch of uh, 3M SPF film placed on the main front window of the car, which is driving through misting rain. You can see that because of the high water repellency of this film, the view is much clearer. Let me play that again, actually. The view is much clearer in the patch as compared to the rest of the window, right? So in the middle of this video, you see that patch and uh, you can compare the visibility through that versus the rest of the window. So this can be placed on other parts of the car as well, uh, or you can put it in for other applications as well. Um, now, for all, uh, so uh, what we'll do now is also see uh, how it looks like when you actually put it on a camera lens, right? So now see the difference when you put it on top of the camera. On the left is the camera with the SPF film on it. Um, so, and in this case, it is showing uh, the back view from a car. Again, Im imagine the use of this film in a factory setting uh, when a better visibility is needed to monitor a process, despite when, uh, when the times when you have vapors or waters uh, and, and you want to see the process through that. Right? So, um, as I mentioned at the start, 3M has more than 20 different divisions that leverages our factories within US and outside the US, across the globe, uh, to manufacture these large variety of products. And many of these factories have some type of computer vision systems installed in there. Um, these same divisions come under four main business groups. And uh, my team within Corporate Research Lab get the opportunities to interact with all of them. So if, if you are interested in having a more longer conversations with me, feel free to connect on the LinkedIn. Um, in summary, based on my learnings, I do believe that understanding the type of manufacturing and the context, it's a key factor while designing computer vision system for product inspection in factories. And uh, leveraging the SPF films I talked about could be very effective in vision-based monitoring of a product or processes in factories. Um, I can take any questions at this point if you have. If you have any question, please uh, input that in the text message. Okay, uh, I think because we are a bit out of time, uh, anyway, so, um, oh, actually, uh, there's one question uh, from Kuram. How do you handle plan to plan variation? Right, that's, that's a good question. Um, there are a lot of techniques um, uh, in the context of domain adaptation, right? Uh, transfer learning. We we leverage some we leverage some of those techniques. Uh, I couldn't go into the more specifics of it, but along those lines, there are a number of different techniques which which we leverage. Okay, so uh, thank Jamo. Um, let us move to the next speaker, Jishan. Uh, uh, can you introduce the next speaker? Yeah, uh, uh, our next speaker is Nandini Anantula. Uh, Nandini, if you could share your screen. So Nandini is a, a VV, uh, so Nandini is an expert in industrial engineering. And basically alongside our other computer vision experts, we wanted to have Nandini talk about the pain points in manufacturing and industrial engineering, because un until we know the problems that, that, that manufacturing people face, it's hard, to, it's hard to come up with solutions for them. Nandini did her graduate studies in industrial engineering at, Te at Texas Technology University, and she has a ton of experience uh, as an as a professional industrial engineer. Right now, she is a an operations program manager for new product introduction at Apple. Before that, she was a senior industrial engineer at Whirlpool, an industrial engineer at General, General Motors, an industrial engineer at need to not products and, and you know even before that she, she, she has done 
stints at other companies. So she she brings in a ton of actual manufacturing, actual industrial engineering experience, uh, you know, in th those spaces. And uh, I'm looking forward to her telling us, you know, what what these pain points in manufacturing are. So and how we can, as a computer vision community, can help so solve some of these pain points. Thanks, Nandini. Please, please take it on. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yep. Yep. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, and I really appreciate each one of you who are taking time to join this uh, workshop. Uh, I think uh, pretty much uh, Zishan covered uh, introduction about me. Uh, as he mentioned, uh, I have always been an industrial engineer professional who spent most of their time on the factory shop floor, uh, working with the operators and uh, finding and fixing the issues. Uh, so that's uh, most of our day to day. Uh, so I do have a quite a bit of factory experience. So usually once the product design is completed, when we actually want to uh, manufacture the product and make the product in the factory, that's when industrial engineers comes into the play. So we are responsible for uh, setting up uh, all the processes, equipment, we decide where the tool should go and uh, we determine what should be the, the work instructions for each of the operator. Uh, so that's a little bit background about uh, what I do. Uh, and then uh, as you mentioned, uh, today in the panel, there are uh, highly professionals uh, who are experts on the computer vision and um, augmented reality and all these, uh, uh, you know, the technological experts. But here uh, I'm uh, about to talk about just the manufacturing in general and what are the challenges that we face to give a little bit perspective from the, the first-hand experience. So when we think about uh, manufacturing factories, uh, we automatically assume that the factories look like something like this. And uh, that might be <laughs> because of some YouTube videos that we have seen and we it's okay to assume that, you know, this is how the factories look like because we are on the right track and we are uh, going in the way of automation. Uh, but in reality, uh, only 10 to 15% of assembly line uh, actually look like this. Uh, so this is the reality of how the major portion of the manufacturing processes look like. Uh, it's very manual. So you'll see uh, operators standing next to each other uh, and assembling all the pa parts with hand manually. And I work with a lot of different uh, companies and a lot of different industries. And uh, this is this is my experience have been with uh, uh, whether it could be a big company or small company. Uh, so this is what I have seen in the manufacturing. And uh, uh, having said that, so that also means uh, uh, we also have a lot of opportunity and uh, we are on the right track. People are embracing the, uh, the automation and the technological advancements. Um, so uh, because we use a lot of the manual labor, uh, we also have challenges around that. So I, uh, in terms of the pain points in manufacturing, I would like to start with the, the challenges involved with the humans operators. So when we talk about any uh, problem solving in manufacturing, uh, we actually use this tool, it's called a fishbone diagram. So you have the, the problem in the front and we try to understand the, uh, the different factors affecting this problem uh, and find out the root cause. So as you can see in manufacturing, the different categories we use is uh, whether the problem coming from a machine or the design or the bad material or the process itself. But uh, I would like to highlight uh, here about uh, the man issues, which are the human errors. Uh, more than any industry, manufacturing knows the pain of the, the human errors. Um, according to one of the studies, 23% of all the downtime, unplanned downtime in manufacturing is because of the human errors. Uh, so what's the reason for this human error, right? So there are... Uh, couple of different ways to think about this. Uh, number one, the most of the human errors happen because of the lack of the knowledge and lack of the training. Um, so talking a little bit about the, the training, as you can see on the screen, the, the right-hand side, uh, there is a screenshot, uh, usually on the manufacturing floor, that is how the workers' instructions are written. So it's a very, it's a piece of paper. It has a step-by-step -step process. And uh, in this example, you can see some of the pictures, but in most cases you won't even have that. So it's a, it's a, it's a 
a plain paper with the instruction. So imagine somebody coming, uh, a new operator coming to work and trying to learn these complex jobs with just a single piece of paper. It's very difficult. So uh, we do have, uh, uh, some companies have the trainers who try to train the operators, but they don't usually spend a lot of time. And uh, on an average, the operator gets maybe one week uh, to learn the jobs. Uh, and, um, and these jobs are really uh, complex. So that's one of the reasons uh, because of that lack of training and knowledge that the mistakes can happen. And then uh, looking at the second reason on uh, why these human errors happen, um, uh, the second reason is it's called slip errors. So it's because mainly because of the forgetfulness, even we as humans, uh, when we go out, sometimes we forget to take our keys. So, you know, it's very, it's very common for anybody, even if it is a well-trained operator or a motivated operator, um, you know, they can forget uh, doing a step or they can forget connecting a part. Uh, so these are the couple of different reasons why the human error happens. So these human errors causes a lot of different quality issues, which would end up, you know, with customer returns and customer complaints. And, um, and it also causes the efficiency loss because you are stopping the line for any, any of these mistakes. So um, talking about the, the human errors and training, uh, there is also another challenge that currently all the industries are facing, which is the turnover issue. Uh, because of the pandemic and COVID, um, you know, this issue has been talked more, but this, this has been an issue even before that. Uh, there are not a lot of people who are willing to do, do these jobs. And, um, and then sometimes it depends on where the factory is. If there is a, if there is a Walmart paying more than you know, working in a manufacturing conditions, then obviously like, people would prefer that. So it's very hard to, uh, hard to uh, hire new workforce. And then even after you hire, it's very difficult to retain that workforce. So because of all these challenges, um, I would like to quickly show uh, a best practice that I came across uh, using technology to resolve this human error. Uh, so one of the best practice I came across, uh, it's a company called Light Guide Systems. Uh, so it's a visual guidance platform. So on the left side, uh, you can see uh, th there are instructions uh, displayed uh, for the operator to look at and uh, uh, perform each of the tasks. Uh, so these um, systems are very helpful in terms of um, training, especially when there is a complex task. And, uh, and we don't really need a separate trainer for this. So if, we, if a company has the system set up, so the operator can actually try to learn the jobs on their own. Uh, so it's very helpful in that aspect. And uh, these systems not only help with training, I have seen the systems also help with the inspection portion of it. So on the right-hand side of the picture, you can see uh, there, is a, there is a white highlighted part. It's actually, the light is indicating the operator that, hey, you missed a connection. So it actually forces the, the, the human labor to uh, perform that task before it goes to the next step. So these kind of uh, uh, you know, augmented reality applications uh, will be very helpful in order to overcome the challenges of the uh, the human errors and the training and the uh, and also the turnover, when we actually uh, try to hire a new labor and uh, train them, there is a cost involved and there is a, a lot of struggle involved that goes through it. Uh, so by using uh, by using these systems, um, not only we can uh, help with the training, but you also get an immediate feedback. So it's always important to fix the issues right when it happens. Uh, as, uh, as we go further into the process, it becomes very difficult to fix that issue and it becomes more expensive. And then uh, I would also like to talk about another pain point in manufacturing, which is ergonomics. Uh, so usually people talk about the safety accidents, uh, but ergonomics is also a big concern because a uh, lot of this manual labor does uh, repetitive uh, task. Uh, so when they perform uh, uh, the repetitive activities, it could lead to a lot of the uh, injuries uh, on the long run. So we as industrial engineers, uh, we spend a lot of time uh, analyzing, um, you know, 
how we can reduce uh, the poor ergonomic conditions. So on the right side here uh, in the picture, you can see um, there are different categories of uh, the bin, like it could be a bending position uh, or uh, the, the angle of the waist. So there are different categories that we analyze in the operator uh, task. And then for every category, uh, you can see there's a category of how much uh, they're walking and how much weight they're carrying. So for each of these categories, we divide the uh, levels into level one, level two, level three. So if an operator's uh, position is at level three, then it's a best ideal condition. But if the operator is at level one, so they have a very poor uh, working condition, which could lead to uh, some injuries in the long run. So when we want to do this analysis, the right now the process we use is we, we capture the videos of the operators doing this work. And then we uh, watch these videos in a slow motion. And then we try to uh, perform the, the category, uh, each category and decide the level. So imagine uh, engineers spending a lot of their time uh, on the shop floor, taking videos and then watching them. Uh, it's, it's really a, a struggle and also it's not the better, uh, better use of the engineer's time. Uh, so uh, one of the uh, best practice I have came across is uh, using the, the computer vision. Uh, we can actually automate this process and then uh, try to identify the, the poor working conditions and the poor ergonomics uh, using, using the technology. So uh, usually uh, when we talk about uh, uh, all these poor economic conditions, in order, to, we are also responsible for fixing them. Once we see any bad condition, we're also responsible for finding a solution. It's even more challenging to come up with a solution because uh, uh, mostly all the construction will happen by that time. So if you have to make any changes to the, the setup, uh, it involves, uh, you know, uh, constructing and uh, demolishing some of the uh, workspaces, uh, which would be very expensive. And not only that, uh, there would be hundreds of other stations attached to one station. So uh, it would affect uh, entire assembly line. So, the, so this, is, uh, this is not practical. And then most of the times we would be struggling to find the difficulties and we come up with some banded solutions uh, which won't uh, uh, help in the long run. So how we can actually uh, fix these issues is uh, identifying them way before in the design, uh, uh, design step. So before even we build a new assembly line, we, we should think about uh, how the working condition should be. So as you can see on the left side uh, pictures, uh, companies like Ford, uh, Chrysler, and Kia, uh, they have been using the, the virtual reality and augmented reality simulations. So what, they, uh, what these simulations do is um, we can actually, uh, uh, we can see the, the actual work, how the actual working condition look like, and we can simulate the, all the steps to understand uh, how the ergonomic uh, conditions are for the operator. So for an industrial engineer like me, this tool is very helpful because we can identify these challenges very early on in the design phase and then fix them rather than waiting until a few years when, when all the construction is done. And uh, looking at the next pain points in manufacturing is I think if you have been listening today, uh, some of the speakers already touched upon the data collection. Uh, so as an industrial engineer, I spend most of the day collecting uh, time studies and downtime data. Uh, so what is time study? Uh, so time study is um, the amount of time it takes for a certain process. So uh, if a worker is performing 10 different steps, so we break down each of them uh, into, a min um, into a, a minute step and try to understand how many seconds that process might take. So this process in the olden days is very manual. People used to do it with uh, stopwatches and a lot of companies still uh, do that process. Uh, so in my experience, uh, as you can see on the left side of the screen, I use this uh, platform where uh, we would upload the video and then uh, for each of the step, you would stop the video. So it captures the time. 
but this process also um, semi-manual because you would still need somebody to go to the shop floor and take the video and upload and then watch the video and play it slowly. So, so one of the best practice I came across is uh, uh, the retro casual came up with uh, uh, using a live ta live task guidance capability. Uh, it, this system can capture uh, the cycle times automatically. Uh, as you can see on the left side here, uh, it has all the steps listed out and it also capturing uh, the seconds it takes for each of the steps. And not only that, it, it also has a uh, AI enabled camera system to detect uh, whether the operator is missing any step. So it also helps with the quality. So these visual and audible uh, alerts will be uh, helpful and it forces the operator uh, not to proceed to the next step until, until the assembly is done correctly. So, so by this way, we can actually make the, the products uh, the right and better the very first time. And talking about the data collection, um, the if, if you don't have the, the proper data, it can actually lead to a very bad decisions as well. So if you look at a, a problem solving for any issue that happens in manufacturing, uh, we start with uh, understanding what is the problem. So we define the problem. And the next step is we try to collect all the different data sources and understand more about why it's happening, where it's happening from, and then identifying the root cause and implementing the solution. And finally, we validate the solution because sometimes what the solution we thought might not be the actual solutions, so it's also important to validate. So in this entire process, you can see uh, the data is a very uh, crucial uh, key highlight here. If we, um, so if you don't have the data, let's say there is a operation where a wire connection is missed. Um, and if you don't have data, then what manufacturing companies do is uh, they take uh, additional uh, uh, operators, human uh, resources, and then they place these resources in uh, different parts of the assembly line. And then those resources just stand there uh, entire day and try to watch, okay, whether the operator is missing this wire connection or if that operator performed it correctly, is it getting disconnected somewhere else? So these are some of the things they try to observe. Um, so it's a, it's a very uh, manual and tedious process. Uh, so this is where we can actually uh, use the technology uh, and not only uh, use the technology to collect the data, but this entire problem solving, we can automate this process. So we can use the AI uh, to even identify the an anomalies. So if we can capture a, a good uh, high quality pictures, so for example, uh, if the manufacturing is happening in China, I'm sitting here in USA, I can even look at those pictures and try, I can identify where the issue is coming from. And not only that, I might not be aware of some of the issue, other issues that's happening. So I would be able to uh, see those. And if we use the technology, which can actually alert you on, hey, there is this anomaly we see this you know different from other so that will also help us to identify the new problem so so this is uh, another area where uh, we can use ai driven data analytics platforms which can also generate some uh, analysis charts uh, so it makes uh, our engineers job a lot easier and okay, so so far I talked about all the different pain points in manufacturing and also uh, gave some examples of the best practice I came across in my experience. Talking about uh, automation or introducing any technology to the manufacturing, uh, there are a lot of different challenges not a lot of people talk about. So from my firsthand experience, uh, I will give an example to explain what, what challenges we see. So as you can see here, there are, three different refrigerators. So over the period, the products evolve and the design changes, the shape changes. So imagine, imagine a concept of a robot picking the label on this refrigerator and applying it automatically. So over the period, the, the design of the label is changing, the position of it is changing. But when we introduce new products, 
the old products don't go away. Yet. So we end up making all these three different type of products on the same single assembly line. And um, it is designed in such a way, in some cases, uh, you would have a first refrigerator coming and then the second one and then the third one. And then these assembly lines run very fast. So the tag time is very, very fast. It can be even like 10, 20 seconds, just to give a random example. So whatever the automation we are trying to introduce, it should be uh, capable to withstand the scale factor. So if you are if you're building like thousands and even millions of products every day, uh, we should be able to uh, withstand the scale factor. And the second thing is uh, with all these, uh, uh, the variations in the product design, uh, it should be able to adapt to those situations. Uh, so if, if we take this example, um, there is certain type of programming is involved in automating this label application. Uh, so in manufacturing, usually there would be more than one shift. So there would imagine a factory with three shifts. So we would have our highly skilled uh, engineers, uh, mostly in the first shift only. So when you go to second shift and third shift, if there are some issues that happens, we would not have any support uh, so it would be very challenging to fix and have any type of maintenance needed. So uh, not only that, uh, when, we, when we try to automate and buy any equipment, we would also have to spend money on the backup equipment because in case something goes wrong with the main one, we can't afford to like, you know, disrupt the, the assembly flow. So there is a cost involved in the backup equipment, which most people not talk about. And uh, in case if something happens and the equipment breaks, uh, there is also a downtime involved in terms of replacing uh, to backup equipment and there is a change over time. And uh, finally, there is also aspect of uh, user interface. If, if we are introducing any technology to manufacturing and if it is not easily accessible by even people on the shop floor, like technicians should be able to easily uh, access and understand the interface. If that interface is not uh, user-friendly, uh, chances are high that we would end up not using it. Uh, and finally, a cost is a very, uh, cost plays a very key uh, role. Um, whatever the technology we try to introduce to the manufacturing, we always, always look at what is the return on investment. So um, if, if there are low cost automation solutions, those are the key for uh, uh, expanding to factories. Uh, if not, we we should always be able to um, able to tell how this technology is going to help, uh, whether it's going to help with our downtime or productivity or quality. We should be able to like uh, put put that into a different category and then tell how much it will save the company. So these are some of the challenges that a lot of people talk, don't talk about, and these are the reasons why. Uh, even though the factories might want to uh, do the automation, they they won't succeed in uh, all the cases. So finally, uh, I would like to say, um, uh, as everyone knows, the product complexity is increasing every day. Uh, if, if, as you can see, uh, right now, there are people doing movies with the phone. So uh, there is so much advancement in the products. And then, at the same time, the user expectations are also increasing. Uh, if, if I'm trying to buy something on Amazon, I look at the reviews and I try to go with the highest review. If there is one or two bad reviews, that would impact greatly. And then the market's also very highly com competitive. So it's important for uh, uh, any product to uh, release on time. So basically, the faster they can introduce the product, the better it is. At the same time, quality is also very important. So uh, as I said, people expectations have increased. Uh, so there is a high standard expectation of quality. So the, the better quality and the faster we can introduce the products to the market, the better it is for the business. So in order to uh, withstand with all these changes, I would say the catalyst here is the technology. Uh, we can, uh, there is a lot of uh, room for opportunities in the different factories. From my experience, as uh, I'm uh, saying that there's a uh, lot of opportunity and then this technology can act as a catalyst and 
I just only talked about a few pain points, but there are hundreds of them. Uh, so we can find solutions with uh, using uh, technology and resolve them and uh, make, make all the factories uh, better factories and smart factories. Uh, so by this, uh, that concludes my talk and uh, I would uh, take any questions that uh, anyone have. I, I would love to kick off the questions, Nandini. Thanks a lot for the talk. <laughs> we really appreciate it. Uh, you talked about the pain points in worker training, quality inspection, ergonomics, time studies. Can, can you speak about how these pain points play into designing a new process? Right. So, you, so ergonomics, yes, it's, if it's already in place, I can understand, I can see how you mo monitor it and so on. But if it, if it doesn't even, you know, how some of these problems apply to when you're designing a new process. Yes, so uh, I think I talked about uh, the ergonomics tool that we use. So when we are trying to uh, introduce any new process, uh, we have like a lot of the CAD models that where we look at the simulations in advance. Um, and then these CAD models will help us to understand, uh, okay, if there is a worker uh, assembling these parts, how, what, what type of movements that the worker would take. So before even, the actual reality happens, we do the simulations uh, to understand in the design phase itself. And then that way we can change uh, either the setup or sometimes we even go back to the product design and say, uh, we, we, talk, we work very closely with the product design team and then we tell them, hey, this design is, is might be good, but then it's not good for factory. So when, when we are trying to do this in the shop floor, uh, it's, it's, it's not convenient, you know, we need to change the design. So there are instances where we would end up changing the design as well. So the early we do this analysis, the better it is for the companies. That, 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 that makes a lot of sense, really appreciate it. Okay. Folks, any other questions for Nandini? Uh, more general in the pain points for manufacturing? If there are none, then th I'll th thank, thank the speaker. Thank you, Nandini. And, and you know, I'll, I'll hand it over to Hui. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Benush Basha uh, as our next speaker. She currently a senior applied scientist uh, at the Global Health Technology Group uh, at Amazon. She was a research intern at uh, Facebook AI Research Lab and Honda Research Institute uh, and obtained her PhD degree in mechanical engineering uh, from University of Washington in uh, 20 and uh, last year. Uh, hi, Benu. Uh, I think you can start your talk now. Hi, thank you so much. Thank you. Let me share my screen. Can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. Thank yes. You. Morning, everyone, and welcome to my presentation. Um, thanks Louis, for the introduction. And today I'm going to tell you about uh, computer vision applications in ergonomics. Suran Dili, she made my work very easy <laughs> now to transition to uh, this uh, presentation. Um, and I wanted to take this uh, initial moment of the presentation to uh, So far I had the opportunity to mix uh, community and uh, introduce to them the power of uh, computer vision and machine learning and how that uh, can impact uh, their field and today I'm very glad that I have the chance same uh, in the computer vision community and tell you more about ergonomics and the potential uh, opportunities for us as computer vision scientists to uh, make impact so uh, We'll be uh, talking about uh, ergonomics and introducing that to you. Um, and then I will delve into uh, the computer vision uh, applications and uh, if I will discuss a few processes in um, the ergonomics um, 
in workplace that uh, there can be applications of computer vision in enhancing uh, those processes. And then I will talk about the challenges from a computer vision perspective on solving these problems and then summarize uh, and open it up for questions. Well, ergonomics as a scientific discipline uh, is a field that is concerned with understanding uh, human interactions uh, with elements in the environment. We uh, also uh, have uh, this discipline as a profession, which is, uh, as Nandini mentioned, um, the job of industrial engineers or uh, injury prevention specialists to apply the theory and principles into designing uh, a better workplace or a product uh, to optimize human well-being um, and experience. There are multiple benefits of having this uh, field and uh, this uh, type of processes and analysis uh, from a worker's perspective or a company perspective. Um, it can lower the cost by reducing the incident rates, uh, the musculoskeletal disorders that happen as a result of continuous poor posture or excessive force. And on the other hand, from product side, uh, it reduces the cost or increases the satisfaction of customers by offering um, a product that engaging and interacting with is pleasant and is also safe. And uh, it also improves um, a better culture, uh, improves employee engagement, uh, better product uh, quality and higher productivity. And ergonomics can be broken down into three main uh, areas. One is cognitive ergonomics, which is uh, the area that deals with uh, mental safety, mental health uh, of uh, workers and and this is where uh, we um, see um, decision making uh, and we also see uh, studies and uh, analysis about human computer interaction uh, and all those areas uh, even like the paint on the wall uh, that how that impacts uh, the performance of uh, the workers and uh, how the product is perceived by customers, all those type of design uh, decision makings. Then we have workplace ergonomics, uh, which is uh, all about workstation design and job design, equipment selection, uh, job assessments, uh, and all of that. And we have uh, organizational ergonomics, uh, which is about uh, how people come together as groups, how to manage them, how to um, think about communication, teamwork, uh, timelines, and all of that. Here today, I will be focused on workplace ergonomics uh, because um, that's where computer vision uh, can have multiple um, applications. And that's actually where I also have better uh, understanding and better knowledge uh, to share with you. In that area, uh, what uh, scientists uh, or safety engineers uh, care about is to pinpoint uh, primary ergonomics risk factors. And these are uh, awkward postures. So they look for awkward posture or in general, like the, the variety of postures that are happening within a eight hour shift uh, of job and the type of uh, force and the level of force that is applied and exerted by people uh, and it's actually very relevant to the posture because that determines the threshold of force uh, that can be tolerated um, or can be exerted and they also look into the repetition of actions that uh, it's very important in uh, fatigue and um, developing musculoskeletal disorders over time uh, as well as the duration of uh, job uh, and the duration of specific activity within the whole uh, process. And if we look into uh, specific ergonomics processes that they happen within the workplace uh, ergonomics, uh, we have postural assessments. Uh, these are um, regulations, uh, uh, like assessment that are um, 
offered by regulations like uh, Occupational Safety and Health Administration or National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. Um, and I listed a couple of them here for you, um, like rapid entire body assessment, uh, rapid upper body uh, assessment, and NIOSH lifting equation. Uh, these assessments are uh, standard procedures that they take into account the type of action, uh, the type of object, and the type of uh, manipulation, like the handling of the object, posture, um, the force level, uh, and all of that into account uh, even um, computing a level of risk. So for instance, in Reba, uh, we uh, receive at the end of going through all the questionnaires and filling out those assessments, we receive a number between zero to 15. Zero means the lowest risk, 15 means the highest risk. And what risk means here in this domain, it's the risk of developing musculoskeletal disorders. So the higher you go, it's more possible that you develop a musculoskeletal disorder. And what a musculoskeletal disorder is, it's uh, anything like low back injuries, disc injuries, neck, uh, joint injuries, uh, muscle tension, uh, strains, anything um, that can actually happen in sports as well. Um, these are all that um, belong to these categories of MSDs uh, that are referred to as workplace MSDs. And, uh, on the other hand, we have time studies. So time studies uh, help us to understand uh, what is the components of jobs. And if we want to uh, introduce a new technology, for instance, if we want to purchase uh, exoskeletons to prevent um, excessive torque on shoulders in a job that is intensive in uh, overhead reach, for instance, we want to make sure uh, that that exoskeleton is actually delivering what uh, its value proposition is, is depending on the specific uh, job or the specific um, systems and processes that are in place in a company, because uh, that's uh, going to be a lot of uh, cost for the company to purchase all these exoskeletons, for instance, uh, and we need to find a metric and a measure to be able to actually uh, assess that in a pilot study, for instance, to see if uh, we see the metric and uh, we see the impact that we are actually looking for. So time studies can be uh, useful there or in any other design um, process uh, or even in a better job assignments, depending on the type of uh, people resources that we have uh, and the type of their capability, uh, we will be able to allocate jobs uh, more wisely if we have a better understanding of the components of the different process paths that are happening across the uh, company or manufacturing floor. Uh, we also have uh, safety trainings uh, that we can use uh, technologies in computer vision uh, very easily, actually, because there are a lot of uh, development in the sports and training, uh, athletic training that can be leveraged here. Uh, because in these safety trainings, we are uh, doing the trainings to teach associates or workers to perform a job safely or uh, we teach them uh, or assign them warm-ups and stretches throughout the day uh, so that it uh, alleviates the stress on muscles and joint and prevent uh, the potential uh, MSDs. So in all of that, uh, we have a lot of uh, technology that is already in use uh, for athletic training. And it's actually interesting to tell you that often in these uh, works uh, that are uh, physically intensive, uh, the workers are called uh, industry athletes. So basically anything that you use for an athletic training, uh, you can use um, in companies and manufacturing floors or warehouses that they have all these athletes uh, that they need training and they need support. Let's uh, delve a little bit deeper into postural assessments uh, that as I told you, they care about uh, identifying the level of ergonomics risk. So from a computer vision perspective, we are dealing with partial or complete sequence of RGB frames. As an output, we are looking for getting a score. But these scores, as I mentioned, they are uh, 
also intertwined with uh, information about action, uh, information about objects, posture, and all of that. And here in this example that I'm showing you, this is uh, an application I developed for the uh, Washington State Department of Labor and Industry in my PhD that is uh, taking into account uh, pose only uh, and it's uh, computing RIBA rapid entire body assessment in real time as an educational tool uh, to demonstrate uh, in workplace uh, what are the activities that are high risk from the perspective of this uh, metric so these tools could be very uh, powerful although uh, maybe from computer vision perspective they are not the most sophisticated end-to-end uh, -end algorithm but they bring a lot of value uh, in industry when um, through educating uh, workers uh, to maintain safe postures and uh, being able to do this monitoring system continuously allows us to develop better understanding uh, of um, the jobs and musculoskeletal disorders uh, that can happen. Because often we uh, look at the incident rate uh, and we understand that in one process path, there are multiple injuries that are happening, for instance, at knees, but we don't know exactly what is causing that. And it's very challenging to pinpoint the root cause of musculoskeletal dis disorders because these are complex injuries that they also can happen um, as a result of um, a highly uh, physical active person at home or at the gym outside the work that uh, just builds off um, the previous injuries and then it just intensifies as the person engages with their daily job. So these continuous monitoring system that uh, they can uh, bring a lot of information that is very useful in making decisions for the business. And if we want to take into account the activity recognition, uh, we, in multiple of these uh, assessments, as I mentioned, we also have, uh, we need to have knowledge about action. Uh, so it's very important that we um, can incorporate activity recognition algorithms uh, we, with these assessment methods that exist, like right, take into account posture, uh, object, action label, to be able to uh, make these predictions either in a real-time setting or in an offline fashion, uh, to be able to create a rich uh, summary of the scene and uh, simplify the work of an engineer or ergonomics specialist who have to uh, do all these time studies uh, and go to the um, site and make all these uh, long observations. And when we get to time studies, I would like to highlight this by showing you this uh, colorful ribbon, how fine grain some of these uh, assessments um, could be uh, with respect to actions that they take into account. That might be very different than uh, the type of data sets as computer scientists we uh, deal with uh, in academia, like Kinetic uh, 400, 600, those type that they have uh, distinct um, activities and they are often come as clips already ready for us uh, to uh, do the activity recognition. These are uh, often very similar uh, actions um, and they are, the difference is in the level of uh, angle of the joint or um, the terminology that ergonomic specialists use in uh, categorizing actions. So that's uh, something I wanted to highlight here that makes um, activity recognition very challenging uh, for these time studies because we want to be able to uh, identify the beginning and end of these fine grain actions uh, because we want to create these summaries and uh, create the reports on how uh, an eight hour job, this eight hour duration, um, how much of that is a squat, how much of that is uh, climbing a step tool, how much of that is walking, how much of that is walking while carrying an object and all of those uh, fine grain actions that they exist. 
And so we wanted to make sure that uh, our algorithm is robust enough uh, to perform in different scenarios um, uh, for doing this uh, semantic segmentation of videos from activity perspective. Having introduced time studies and ergonomics risk assessment, let's see how uh, that is actually being done. Uh, so by now you have a little bit of familiarity with the process, uh, but to iterate uh, how things are done is that usually a safety engineer, an ergonomist, or an uh, injury prevention specialist, they go to sites, uh, they have uh, the sheet for the assessment, uh, they know the questions they need to ask, the observation they need to make, um, and they go to the site, uh, they choose a station, and, and they stay there for 20, 30 minutes, uh, observing how um, a worker and associate performing that job. And they often also create some video recordings uh, to take a look at that later on. And, and they take their notes and they often use uh, some uh, software that allows them to organize this tabular data that they collect to create these reports. And it's actually very common in uh, many companies uh, that they look for accurate uh, results of an assessment to ask multiple engineers to assess the same process uh, to get an average of the reports and be more certain about the conclusions that they want to draw. And these uh, 20 minutes observations of one or two, at max 10 people performing a job, are going to result uh, into a report that is uh, going to summarize the whole eight-hour shift across many people uh, with different uh, anatomy, uh, physiology, like diverse group of people based on just these few observations. So you see that there's a lot of potential because this, these solutions are not scalable. And for the same reason that they are costly to um, use the time of engineers for these analysis, they might actually not happen as regular as they should be. And let's take a look at the challenges from computer vision perspective. So this video that you see, it's actually a video I collected as a part of my PhD at University of Washington. But in reality, this is not, this is like an ideal video because uh, it's, the lighting is good and the order of actions, it's something I instructed the person to do. Uh, and it's done very clean uh, in, with a very reasonable pace. Um, and the order of the actions are uh, very similar across all the people we had uh, recorded for this data set. But in reality is that the actions are organic. There is no order, uh, maybe in a manufacturing uh, process, uh, there are orders uh, that we can take into account. But in many other scenarios, uh, like in uh, warehouses, in fulfillment centers, the task is defined, but the order that someone is doing the task is not necessarily defined. So if you want to do analysis, activity recognition, or semantic segmentation, your algorithm should be robust in those temporal variations, let alone to uh, all other uh, challenges. And it has to be, uh, as I mentioned, robust into uh, getting into the fine grain details of uh, different actions that ergonomics care about. On the other hand, uh, new uh, research uh, in the field of ergonomics uh, is showing the importance of the kinematics of movement. So that is uh, beyond joint angles. Uh, that is looking into the acceleration that someone is lifting an object, for instance. A lot of research shows that uh, if you lift an object uh, really quickly from the floor, the impact on your uh, lower back is much more than if you lift it up with a reasonable uh, lower acceleration. So if you want to bring the ergonomics risk assessment to a next level and improve it from that perspective as well, we want to be able to create algorithms that allow us to bring in biomechanics uh, and kinematics of movement as well. We also, uh, as uh, we want to 
have this assessment as close as to the real thing that is happening on manufacturing floor, we need to be able to deal with uh, not ideal uh, environment condition. So these are, for instance, in this inbound dock, uh, you see that the lighting is not in the best uh, lighting uh, that is preferred for a computer vision algorithm. So our approach to solving this problem should be um, so that it accommodates these type of environments as well. And then the in, we cannot make any interference to the job of uh, someone when creating these reports. So if when engineers go on site to make observation, they keep their distance, they allow people to perform as they are operating. So that's another point we need to take into account uh, that um, the job has to happen in its uh, planned way. So to summarize, uh, this uh, the domain that we are looking into and we wanted to uh, work in as computer scientists is a very challenging interdisciplinary domain that cares about, uh, I mean, we will see human uh, detection, uh, pose estimation, uh, object detection, and human object interaction all together in an environment that is organic. And then we also need to develop these understandings about ergonomics risk metrics. And uh, this is something uh, to talk to engineers and ergonomics risk assessment specialists that their algorithms and their um, pipelines also have to uh, get updated and enhanced uh, for adopting computer vision or machine learning solutions as well. So we are dealing with this highly interdisciplinarily challenging uh, and very interesting um, domain and environment to work in. And with that, I would like to thank you all and open it up for questions and feel free to reach out to me uh, for a coffee or any discussion. Thank you so much. If you have a question, please input in the text message for Benush. Okay, uh, if no one have a question, then uh, maybe I can ask. Uh, it seems that uh, uh, you use only uh, 2D Spark human choice as input. Uh, have you thought about using like 2D uh, human choice or like dance human self for uh, oh, yeah ergonomic safety evaluation? Yeah, so actually uh, I have been using 3D Pose. For that application, uh, I used 2D because uh, deploying it on the phone, uh, it I tried to deploy a 3D Pose um, detection on the phone, uh, but at the time uh, it was very slow. So I didn't do it for that phone application. Uh, but for all the other uh, publications, it, it has been always 3D pose. It actually really uh, makes a difference because most of the joint angles, depending on the perspective of the camera, uh, it actually uh, affects the prediction of the joint angles if uh, that's the only um, input to the model for ergonomics risk assessment. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, Karam have a question. How do you define safe versus uh, unsafe action? Are there OHHA standards that you use? So uh, that is actually something that uh, OSHA and NIOSH, uh, they determine. It's, uh, I mean, that's a long uh, discussion, but there is a lot of new publications coming from uh, the uh, ergonomics uh, experts uh, that they're uh, bringing and introducing new metrics, as I mentioned, like acceleration into account. Uh, but the metrics that are have been used in industry, they're uh, actually pretty basic, like RULA, RIBA, they're basic, and there are reasons for that, because they wanted pe anyone uh, to be able to use these metrics and assessment that they are often based on just joint angle. Like if you reach more than, I don't know, like 100 degrees up or overhead for this amount of time, then it's high risk. So it's not necessarily uh, uh, individualized uh, based on people's uh, anatomy and uh, it's not taking into account diversity 
from that perspective at all. And it's very uh, simplistic. So it doesn't have any of the biomechanics um, science behind it. Um, there are new uh, methods that are coming out from the human factor uh, experts and that take into account more factors. Uh, but to answer your question at the moment, it's mainly about the thresholds that are set by NIOSH and OSHA uh, for the number of repetitions, the duration of action, the level of force, as well as the joint angles. So these are the uh, factors that are taken into account. Um, there is also some like the type of grip uh, that there are categories for that um, to take into account as well. Another question from uh, Ria. Uh, so she asked whether uh, you use some retrain model for object detection and pole estimation or you train your own model? So, uh, I mean, definitely off the shelf as it is, and it's not going to work for, I mean, depending on the type of objects that you have, uh, but there are like a lot of really good uh, models that exist that you can fine tune uh, for your own purpose as well. Uh, so it's a mix, it's a combination uh, of um, like, I mean, if you're talking about just my PhD, I have used like, uh, uh, detectron or like faster RCNN type uh, algorithms for object detection, uh, but in industry you often also develop your own. Uh, one more question. Uh, what kind of in uh, environmental risk do you detect, like oil spill or ex excess heat? I'm reading what the question of, one more time to make sure I okay. understood it. Uh, what kind of environmental risk uh, that you can uh, detect, like always spill or like uh, overheat? So uh, those are all like uh, different, uh, basically risks that as like industrial engineers or safety engineers you care about. Um, just using vision only system, if that's what we are using, probably an oil spill could be detected, but I'm not sure if excessive heat can be uh, detected, just like RGB videos. The analysis of time is done frame wise or based on video? Uh, so I'm not sure if I follow the question exactly. Uh, if the question is that, is it like, is the model making predictions frame-wise? Uh, that is true. It is making predictions frame-wise um, in the work I presented. And um, but the time studies, it basically, if you predicted, I, I don't know, three squads in a video, uh, you know the beginning and end of that. Uh, you want to compute the uh, percentage of squad within that video. So that's what I meant by doing a time study. But any prediction you saw, it's frame-wise, but the frequency of prediction is really based on how, uh, I mean, it's based on like uh, how accurate or how frequent you want to get that prediction. Okay, uh, thanks, Benu. Um, sure. Let us move to the next speaker. Uh, I will transfer to Jishan for the introduction. Everyone, th thanks a lot, Benu. That was really amazing. Uh, I'll move on to, uh, so we'll move on to Bugra Tekken. Uh, Bugra, if you could share your screen. Uh, Bugra is currently a senior scientist at Microsoft uh, HoloLens team in Zurich. Uh, before that, uh, he did a PhD in computer vision from the EPFL, the Ecole Polytechnique Federal uh, de Lausanne in, Z in Switzerland. And uh, he's been working on 3D human pose estimation, object detection, how these two go together. To my knowledge, his work was one of the first to do a six DOF object pose estimation uh, using deep learning, and as far as I know. And you know, I really love this work of his a few years ago when you could just take any standard object detector and, and make it spit out you know, 3D uh, poses for objects. So any, anyways, yeah, over to Bugram. I'm a big fan of his work, so sorry about that. Yeah. 
Thanks a lot, Zishan, for the introduction. Um, and hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending this talk. Um, and thank you to organizers for the invitation. It's a, it's a pleasure to speak at this workshop. Um, today, I will talk about computer vision and mixed reality applications for factories and frontline workers, uh, with a particular emphasis on uh, some of the computer vision and mixed reality solutions uh, we have at Microsoft for uh, factory floors. Um, so here's an outline of the talk. Uh, first, I will talk about some brief overview of computer vision and mixed reality applications with a particular focus on factory floors and frontline workers. Uh, then I will talk about some of the computer vision and mixed reality solutions we have at Microsoft for factory floors. Uh, then I will explain how we can collect data for applications in industry and how we can generalize machine learning models for factory floors. Um, I will then go on with explaining some of our research work on egocentric action recognition and understanding hand object interactions. And lastly, I will, I will finish with an outlook for uh, future applications of computer vision uh, for, for factory floors. Um, as you are all aware, uh, there has been a tremendous increase in the interest and the application areas of computer vision uh, over the past decades. Uh, here are just a few groundbreaking work from early 70s to today. The years of research has now resulted in uh, wide application areas in industry, and the trend um, only seems to go upwards. Um, years of work in computer vision also now stimulates different applications in mixed reality. Uh, now we have devices like HoloLens that provides uh, full-fledged computer vision and mixed reality applications like real-time tracking of hands, head, and eyes uh, within a variable computer. Um, development of new robust techniques and methods in computer vision uh, resulted in a widespread use of these techniques across different industries. Uh, one of the first applications was optical handwritten character recognition. Then we have seen an emergence of different applications in medical imaging, self-driving cars, uh, drone-based photogrammetry, surveillance and mixed reality. Um, specifically for factories, for manufacturing and enterprise scenarios, uh, computer vision has found application areas in visual inspection, uh, warehouse picking, uh, lean manufacturing and task guiding. Um, all of these um, applications aim to improve uh, productivity in factories and uh, reduce production time and cost. Uh, visual inspection, for example, allows for rapid part inspection for quality assurance purposes and uh, looks for defective products and parts in manufacturing settings. Uh, warehouse picking uses robotic arms uh, to pick and fulfill orders and allows for rapid handling of objects uh, produced in a factory. Uh, lean manufacturing aims to reduce times and waste within the production system. And more recently, uh, task guidance applications using action recognition uh, gained interest in the community and in and industry uh, for its potential in improving uh, worker productivity. Uh, these techniques recognize user actions and guides the worker uh, through different steps of a complete task um, in, in manufacturing uh, settings. Um, the computer vision applications for uh, factory floors aim to automate tasks to scale up production um, and provide quality control uh, to eliminate defective products. In addition, uh, they aim to train and guide frontline workers to improve their efficiency and keep track of relevant data uh, for business analytics purposes. Um, although the promise of these application areas are high, uh, there are also many challenges of computer vision for manufacturing and factory settings. Uh, one of the main challenges is regarding the complex environments, machineries, and processes within factory settings. Uh, also, in relation to this, machine learning models trained on standard data sets for image and video understanding um, have a hard time in, in generalizing to factory environments. Most of the time, uh, machine learning models for factory floors and frontline workers uh, require domain-specific data, uh, which is often costly to collect and label. Uh, while there are some challenges, there are also many opportunities and room for impact uh, for computer vision and mixed reality uh, in manufacturing settings. 
um, to start off, um, I mean, constraint environments uh, in manufacturing settings make it easier to collect targeted data uh, specific to the application and develop machine learning models specific to that scenario. In a sense, um, the constraint environments of factory floors don't penalize overfitting that much, uh, which makes it easier to train models on such data. Uh, similarly, well-defined uh, manufacturing processes uh, don't have much variation in the data, and therefore uh, creating machine learning models on such data uh, would be more straightforward and would have the potential to provide good accuracy. Also, the uh, continuous improvements uh, in the robustness of computer vision and machine learning techniques uh, are quite promising for uh, manufacturing environments of the future. Um, Having discussed some of the applications, uh, challenges, and opportunities of computer vision for factory floors, let me now move on to uh, explaining some of the solutions we have at Microsoft using computer vision and mixed reality for factory floors. Um, at Microsoft mixed reality team, we have a large set of solutions leveraging HoloLens for factory floors and frontline workers. Uh, some examples of them are uh, Azure Special Anchors, Azure Object Anchors, uh, Dynamics 365 Guides, and Remote Assist. Uh, in addition to uh, these solutions uh, we have at Microsoft, uh, we also perform research for uh, action recognition and robotics for potential future applications in, uh, in manufacturing and enterprise settings. I will now go over some of these uh, different computer vision mixed reality solutions uh, we have at Microsoft. Um, the first one I will talk about is uh, Azure Special Anchors. Uh, Azure Special Anchors is a, is a cloud-based camera localization service uh, that allows users to place uh, mixed reality content in the 3D space, uh, which persists across changes in the environment. Also, this mixed reality content could be shared with other users uh, within a common coordinate system. Um, Azure Special Anchors enables developers to work uh, with mixed, mixed reality platforms to perceive spaces, designate precise points of interest, place persistent uh, 3D holographic content in the environment, and recall those points of interest from, uh, from supported uh, devices, uh, supported mixed reality devices. Uh, these precise points of interest are referred to as special anchors. In the context of manufacturing settings, as can be seen in this image, um, Azure Special Anchors allows for placing digital business data in the form of 3D holograms within real-world factory settings for uh, facility management, uh, manufacturing, and retail. In a sense, um, it puts real-time data at the fingertips of employees, enabling them uh, to make better, faster, and more informed decisions. Um, Azure Object Anchors is uh, another mixed reality service we have at Microsoft uh, that provides uh, 60 object pause estimation capabilities. Uh, with this service, given a 3D model of the object, uh, physical objects are detected by their shape uh, using HoloLens's depth camera. Uh, it helps users to create rich immersive experiences uh, by automatically aligning 3D content uh, with physical objects. Um, an example of this actually uh, can be seen seen on this on this image. It allows users to gain contextual understanding of objects without the need for markers or manual alignment. Uh, with this, it saves significant touch labor, uh, reduce alignment costs, um, and improve user experiences by building mixed reality applications with uh, Azure Object Anchors. Um, another mixed reality solution for factory floors I would like to talk about is uh, Dynamics 365 Guides. Uh, Guides is a mixed reality application for Microsoft HoloLens that helps operators uh, learn the flow of work by providing holographic instructions when and where they are needed. These instruction cards are visually tethered to the place where the work is done and can include images, videos, and 3D holographic models. Operators see exactly uh, what needs to be done and where, so they can get the job done faster uh, with fewer errors and greater, uh, greater skill retention. Uh, Dynamics 365 Guides 
uh, provides heads up, hands free, step by step instructions during the flow of work, uh, whether employees are doing complex procedures on the job or uh, training away from the production line. Uh, operators control the interface with their gaze using a glance to move to the next step, uh, which leaves their hands free to do the work. Instruction cards follow the operator as they are performing the task and, not as, and as they move around the equipment. Uh, holograms point to the tools and parts that they need and show them exactly how and where to use them. Uh, the experience is quite comfortable and simple to use, and it helps reduce mental processing time, errors, and the need to rely on a body system in manufacturing settings. Um, managers can also use the dashboards to view rich data about how processes are working for their employees. Using this data, they can continually analyze and improve processes uh, without having to do expensive studies. Um, by combining guides and Azure object anchors, uh, it is also now possible to anchor a holographic guide with a physical object. Uh, when an author or an operator uh, goes to their work area and opens a guide, the holographic content is automatically anchored to the object of interest, uh, as can be seen in this visualization. They don't have to manipulate um, a hologram or scan a printed marker to anchor the guide. Overall, this mixed reality service uh, enhances learning and standardizes processes uh, with step-by-step -step instructions that show employees how to use tools and parts in, uh, in real work situations, reduce errors, and helps in increasing safety. Uh, this is also useful for business analytics applications, uh, where the time data from these holographic tutorials could be used to maximize uh, operational effectiveness. Um, Another mixed reality application targeting manufacturing settings is remote assist, which allows technicians to collaborate with experts while they are performing their tasks, even in remote locations. With this uh, app, an expert uh, could call in a technician uh, from HoloLens while she's doing the job and can see the machinery to be able to guide the user. Uh, this can help the frontline worker to decide uh, what needs to be done on the machinery and complete the task at hand. It allows for remote inspections and combines video, screenshots, and annotations on the devices to better guide the, guide the frontline worker. In addition to the solutions we have at Microsoft, uh, we also perform research for uh, future potential applications of computer vision and mixed reality in factory settings. Uh, let me first start with our uh, first research focus. Action recognition uh, is a field we are interested in uh, due to its potential in providing better task guidance in frontline worker scenarios. Uh, here is a quick action recognition demo using HoloLens data. Here we get synchronized hands, head, eye tracking data and normalize it with respect to the object pose computed by uh, Azure object anchors. So once we have all this hands, uh, head, eye, and object tracking data, um, object tracking data, uh, we train on this data an action recognition model uh, based on neural network training. Uh, you, you can see here the predictions of the model on top of the visualization. So here the scenario I'm demonstrating is a, is a cartridge placement setup, uh, which tries to, in a sense, uh, simulate a task that could be done in a factory by a first-line worker. Using low-dimensional parameterized pose vectors as input to our machine learning model, uh, we can achieve good generalization with moderate amounts of data and a smaller machine learning model uh, that is easier to deploy on device. In addition to our efforts in action recognition, uh, at Microsoft Mixed Reality and AI Lab in Zurich, uh, we perform research on enabling interaction between mixed reality and robotics via cloud-based localization. Uh, the team extended Azure Special Anchors to enable robots to localize to the same coordinate system provided by Azure Special Anchors. This allows robots to share a coordinate system and special data with mixed reality devices like HoloLens and also within each other. Uh, this would allow robots to have greater autonomy by accessing contextual holographic information from other devices and mixed reality uh, cloud services. 
Uh, in addition, colocalization with mixed reality offers many new possibilities for human-robot interaction uh, by giving HoloLens users insights into robots' states and intentions and enabling natural modes of interaction through hand tracking and gaze tracking. Um, having discussed some of the solutions we have at Microsoft and some of the research we, we perform uh, in our group, I'm now moving on to um, another important aspect of computer vision and machine learning for factory floors. Uh, this is about data and generalization. Uh, the lack of data and generalization are still challenges that needs to be addressed in this domain, as with many other uh, applications of computer vision and machine learning in industry. Um, so, as I just told, as with many other AI applications, computer vision and machine learning for factory floors also require specific data to be collected in manufacturing and frontline worker scenarios. Uh, to enable data collection with HoloLens, uh, we have recently released HoloLens research mode, uh, which allows users to collect synchronized data for head poses, hand poses, eye gaze directions, RGB images, grayscale images, and depth images. So all these streams can be correlated in time, and they can be put in a common coordinate system. Uh, we released a, a part of this data capture tool as open source in collaboration with people from our lab in Microsoft Zurich, uh, Redmond, and Cambridge teams. Um, another aspect of computer vision models in factory floors is that machine learning models train on standard data sets for image and video understanding uh, have a hard time in generalizing to factory environments. Uh, towards more generalizable models for action recognition, uh, in a research study, we proposed a technique for peer shot transfer learning for first-person action classification. Here, we leverage independently trained local visual cues to, to learn representations that can be transferred from a source domain to a different target domain using only a handful of examples. Uh, visual cues we employ uh, include um, object interactions, hand grasps, and motion within regions that are a function of hand locations. We employ a framework based on meta-learning uh, to extract the distinctive and domain invariant components of the visual cues. Uh, this enables transfer of action classification models across public data sets captured with diverse scene and action, action configurations. Now let me also mention some of our other research work on understanding hand-object interactions and first-person action recognition. Um, understanding egocentric actions is mostly about understanding hand-object in, uh, interactions. Um, furthermore, having 3D positions of hands and objects would allow for giving more precise feedback to users uh, for task guidance scenarios in mixed reality settings. Uh, therefore, we've been researching on understanding 3D hand and object interactions. Um, to this end, in a CDPR 19 study, we have developed a unified neural network architecture uh, that simultaneously solves in a single pass of the network four different problems. That is 3D hand pose estimation, 6D object pose estimation, object recognition, and action recognition. Uh, we have further built a temporal model to reason about interactions uh, and to recognize actions of the person using estimated hand and object poses. Here's an example video demonstrating the results of the algorithm. Our method can estimate 3D hand and 6D object poses reliably, even when they are occluding each other. It can further recognize interactions between them uh, using the estimated 3D poses of hands and objects. The model here uh, works on full images and does not require initial 2D detections, it can also work with different input modalities uh, such as RGB, RGBD, depth, and grayscale, and it doesn't require the knowledge of the detailed 3D hand and object meshes. Um, in a similar line of work, we have developed another method for weakly supervised hand object pose estimation uh, that reduces the need for annotated hand and object poses. Uh, this study was published in uh, CVPR 2020. Here in the study, uh, we can also estimate the full shape of a hand interacting with an object. Here we first reconstruct 3D hand and the object by inferring their poses. Given our estimated reconstructions, 
uh, we differentially render the optical flow between pairs of adjacent images and use it within the network warp one frame to another. We then apply uh, a photometric loss uh, that relies on the visual consistency uh, and uh, uh, using this technique, uh, we can reach to similar accuracies uh, with the state of the art while using only a few percent of the of the annotated data. Um, as data for realistic 3D hand object interactions is sorely lacking, we've also had efforts in collecting data and setting baselines on this problem. Uh, in a recent ICCV21 study, we propose a method to collect the data set of two hands manipulating objects for first person interaction recognition. We provide a rich set of annotations, including action labels, object classes, 3D left and right hand poses, 6D object poses, uh, camera poses, and scene point clouds. Uh, we further propose a method to jointly recognize the 3D poses of two hands manipulating objects and a novel topology aware graph convolutional network for recognizing hand object interactions. Our framework models the interactions between hands and objects in 3D, recognized actions from uh, first person views, and yields state of the art accuracy. Having discussed some of the existing solutions and research on using computer vision and mixed reality for uh, factory floors, uh, let me conclude with an outlook for uh, some future perspectives uh, on this domain. Uh, there's a great potential for computer vision and mixed reality at the factory floors, uh, given the fast pace of improvement uh, in image and video understanding. Uh, most of the work so far uh, focused on image-based analysis of work environments, machineries, and products. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there's also uh, great potential in video understanding tasks like action recognition and procedure learning uh, in the context of manufacturing settings for uh, task guidance purposes. Uh, the lack of data and generalization uh, are still challenges that need to be addressed in this domain. Uh, to this end, uh, methods that rely on less supervision and less data uh, would make AI models for factory floors uh, more prevalent in the future. Uh, furthermore, 3D understanding of the objects and the environment around uh, would provide uh, context-aware applications for frontline workers and would further improve the performance of task guidance, uh, operator training, uh, and visual inspection. So thank you for listening. Uh, I'd be happy to answer uh, any questions uh, you might have. Thanks a lot, Bugra. Uh, I'll, I'll kick off the Q&A session with, with, with one that, that's, uh, that's in my mind. Uh, you, you showed this example, of, I think, with, with the HoloLens, where you are tracking the scene, you're tracking the object in 3D, and then you are tracking the hand, I presume, right? To detect, understand the steps of the activity. And that, that was kind of the at the beginning of the talk, but then later you also showed a lot of your work, including ICCV 2021 work, mm -hmm. where you could presumably do all of that without 3D tracking, right? Just, just using neural networks, I presume. How do, how do these two compare? Have you had a chance to maybe do quantitative evaluation is it helpful at all to do 3D tracking? Um, yeah, so thanks a lot for the uh, great question. Um, so uh, since we are mainly working with HoloLens, um, HoloLens already provides us um, all this high-level information like uh, hand tracking, eye tracking, uh, head tracking, and it's, it's quite actually accurate. Uh, the reason why we use uh, these uh, low dimensional representations is mostly for efficiency purposes. Of course, uh, we can start from RGB images, uh, but, but the network we would use for, for inferring from RGB images uh, would, be, uh, would be more complex and would be hard to deploy uh, on device for real time processing. Uh, so the main advantage of using these uh, low dimensional representations uh, is uh, is efficiency, uh, but of course, um, uh, like from a research perspective, uh, it's uh, it's also uh, now possible to infer all this high level uh, information like hand tracking, head tracking, eye tracking directly from RGB images and use it. Um, in terms of accuracy, I think um, like the better the pause estimates, uh, better the 3D pause estimates. 
the more accurate we get, uh, uh, the more accurate action recognition results we get. Um, so this will also, uh, like the accuracy will improve further uh, with the improvements in the state of the art uh, for pause estimation of Hansen objects. Got it. That makes sense. Appreciate it. Folks, any other questions for Bugra? If not, we can we can move on. Thanks a lot, Bugra. Really appreciated that talk. Uh, our, our next, yeah, our next speaker is is is, is one of my co-organizers, Kwakwi Tran. Uh, Dr. Tran has a has a PhD from the University of Adelaide in computer vision. He spent about five years at NEC, NEC Laboratories America in the Bay Area, where he was working on uh, self-driving cars. And right now he's a he's a he's the co-founder and CTO at, at a startup called RetroCausal, uh, that, that's funded by NASA's Human Research Program grant. And I'm I'm sure he'll he'll, he'll have more to talk about that. Uh, Dr. Tran, please take it away. Uh, thanks, Isan, for the introduction. Uh, hi, everyone. So. So uh, today I will talk about our uh, research efforts at retro causal on uh, unsupervised and semi-supervised temporal activity segmentation for improving frontline productivity. Uh, nowadays, up to 20% of revenue is lost due to uh, quality issue on assembly line. Uh, this happens because of several reasons. Uh, experienced workers uh, are retiring temporary worker uh, become more and more popular, new processes uh, are introduced frequently, and uh, multiple products are assembled on the same line. To um, improve frontline productivity, we need to answer a few questions. Uh, what has happened in the past uh, on the factory floor? What is happening now? And uh, how can we improve the processes uh, on the factory floor? Uh, at RetroCosho, we are building live task guidance system which use computer vision to track the step that the worker is doing and provide uh, live feedback to the worker. Uh, uh, let us have a look uh, at one example video. In this uh, example, uh, the worker is assembling a desktop computer. Uh, there is a camera at the top which observe the worker and um, would observe the worker and uh, did, did, did the user interface uh, of our system. Uh, on, the, on the left, you see the step list uh, with the current step uh, in both. Uh, in addition, we also measure the individual time uh, spent on each step. And uh, some steps are actually uh, have a subtle uh, change. Uh, for example, like tightening through one, two, through four. If the worker uh, make a mistake, uh, our system will notify her. Uh, if you can see uh, in this example, uh, the worker is a uh, the, the worker for, forget to connect the Y to the HDD. So uh, the, the, the system notify her and then uh, so that she can fix the mistake uh, immediately. And uh, because of that, she able to complete the task correctly. In addition, we also uh, provide both prescriptive and descriptive analytics. Uh, for example, like the error rate, the, the average time spent on each individual step, which can be used for, improve, uh, for improving the processes on the factory floor. Although uh, supervised learning for temporal activity segmentation provide us with high accuracy, it requires frame-wise label, which can be uh, very expensive. That, that is why we see the need for unsupervised and semi-supervised uh, learning. Uh, the accuracy of unsupervised learning for temporal activity segmentation is a bit low. 
However, it requires uh, little uh, labeling effort and uh, it can discover the task structure automatically. In addition, uh, unlabeled video, video are available almost uh, unlimitedly. Uh, finally, uh, semi-supervised learning uh, provide a reasonable trade-off between the um, uncertain requirement and the second certain accuracy. Uh, let me see if I can Okay. Um, so next, uh, I will present our uh, work on unsupervised video alignment for label transfer. Uh, this work was presented uh, at the CVVI 2021 uh, conference. So uh, our main idea uh, is that if we can develop uh, a, a method for aligning the video in time, we can then use it to propagate label uh, from a set, uh, a small set of label video to a large number of uh, unlabeled video. Here is uh, one example result of our unsupervised video alignment uh, method uh, for label transfer on the pan action dataset. Uh, at the top left, we show the reference video. Uh, at the bottom left, we show the query video. At the top right, we show the query video aligned to the reference video. At the bottom Right, you see the TSNE visualization of the frame embedding of the two video uh, by our method. Each point uh, denote a frame, and the blue and the green color uh, represent the two video. Uh, as you can see, our method can reliably uh, align the two video uh, of the same activity despite last variation in uh, viewpoint. Uh, Camera, uh, in, in camera viewpoint, background, and uh, motion. Given two input video X and Y, uh, we first pass them uh, through an encoder network, FTTA, uh, to obtain uh, the embedding, uh, the, the frame Y embedding, uh, FTTA X and FTTA Y. Uh, next, we use a differentiable a version of a dynamic time webbing uh, called sub-DW to compute the temporal alignment uh, discrepancy between the two video and minimize it. Uh, however, optimizing only for sub-DW lead to the trivial solution where on the frame are mapped to the same point uh, in the emitting space. And uh, that produced uh, the zero uh, alignment loss to address that issue, we add the temporal regularization term uh, called contrasty ID, uh, inverse different moment or con contrasty IDM. Contrasty IDM uh, optimized for uh, temporarily uh, this entangled uh, representation. In particular, it encouraged temporary closed frame to be mapped to nearby point in the emitting space and uh, temporarily distant frame to be mapped to far away point in the emitting space. And uh, this help avoid the trivial solution and improve the generalization ability. For quantitative evaluation, our method achieved uh, noticeable improvement gain uh, for different five grand tasks. For example, we achieved 3% uh, uh, performance gain over state the app method for five grand frame retrieval. Uh, in addition, we also achieve a uh, significant uh, performance gain over fully supervised baseline and uh, state-of-the-art methods such as TCC, SAL, and um, TCN in the few short learning setup. Here, I'm showing uh, another example video of our unsupervised video alignment method on the Panaxon dataset. Uh, again, the, the top left show the uh, reference video. The bottom left show the query video, and uh, the bottom right show the query video aligned to the reference video.
And uh, similarly, uh, we can see that our method can uh, align the two video uh, precisely uh, despite, uh, despite different in uh, viewpoint appearance and motion. And um, this is one more example video uh, on the desktop assembly data set, which consists of um, a long and multi-step activity. Uh, we would like to emphasize that uh, there, there, there was no label used for training uh, this model. And uh, noted that the, the step uh, of the activity are aligned precisely uh, between the two, uh, across the two actors. Now let us have a look at the TSNE uh, visualization uh, where the frame corresponding to the same step are clustered in the embedding space. And uh, that's, uh, that is what the learn embedding function uh, are uh, supposed to do. Uh, it aim to learn an embedding space uh, where uh, frame belong to the same action are mapped to uh, nearby point in the embedding, in the embedding space. In, a, in addition, our methods uh, it can also capture more fine grained cues uh, compared to uh, previous work like TCC. Uh, on the left, we see a query image which show the uh, stick swing back uh, step in the go swing activity. Uh, the top row show the five nearest uh, frame in the embedding space that are retrieved by our method. And as we can see, uh, the top image show the same active, the, the same step as in the query image where the, the ball is, uh, can be visible uh, in this image. Uh, for, for temporal cycle consistency, uh, it, it retrieved uh, a few very similar looking images However, they are uh, at a different step uh, in the activity. Uh, for example, if highlighted by the pink circle, the bone uh, is not visible here, which means that uh, the action is at, uh, it, 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 at the, the end of the activity. Next, I will uh, discuss one uh, of our work on unsupervised temporal activity segmentation. This work is going to uh, be represented at the Baylon uh, 2021 symposium. So given a collection of unlabeled video, uh, the goal of unsupervised temporal activity segmentation is to automatically segment the video and uh, cluster um, and they, they discover the action by grouping the frame across on the video into cluster with each cluster corresponding to one of the action. Uh, this slide shows us one of the example uh, result of our method. This is one of the video on in the 50 salad data set. The top, uh, at the top we show the input video and at the bottom we show the segmentation uh, result predicted by our method with the red arrow show the current um, the current frame. And we can see that uh, our method can uh, segment the video relatively well uh, despite the subtle change uh, between the action.
previous work for unsupervised temporal activity segmentation usually treat uh, representation learning and clustering at two the joy step so um they 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 take the entire data set as input and they first perform representation learning uh, by using a retext task and then compute the, the learn uh, representation for the entire data set. After that, they will fit the learn representation for the entire data set into uh, a clustering module uh, to, to uh, obtain the segmentation result. There are several uh, disadvantages uh, with these approaches. Uh, first, they require uh, the, the learn representation uh, for the entire data set to perform apply clustering. And uh, it is also a, a multi step process. And lastly, um, it can provide inconsistent uh, cluster uh, because there's no feedback from the clustering module uh, to the segmented uh, learning module. Our methods, on the other hand, uh, take a small MIDI batch as input and uh, it perform uh, representation learning and on client uh, clustering in a single uh, frame, a joint framework. There are a few uh, advantages uh, with uh, our approach. It can achieve higher accuracy and uh, require, uh, require significant less memory uh, usage. And also uh, because there, there, there is a continuous feedback between the representative learning and the online clustering module, um, the generated results uh, are consistent. Given uh, a MIDI batch of for training iteration, um, we sample a small MIDI batch uh, of frame level feature, uh, we call X here, and uh, we then pass X approved an encoder network aptita to obtain uh, the embedding feature Z. We then apply a temporal coherent loss on the embedding uh, feature Z. Uh, the temporal coherent loss uh, encourages temporally coherent representation by uh, encouraging nearby frame to be mapped to nearby point in the emitting space and far away frame to be mapped to far away point in the emitting space. To perform online clustering, we learn uh, a set of prototype vector called C. Uh, each prototype vector represents one class or one step of the activity. We then compute the similarity between the prototype and the feature to obtain the predicted cluster assignment would tell us the probability uh, that its frame belongs to uh, a particular cluster. Since there is no supervision uh, signal or no label uh, for training, uh, we rely on the temporal optimal transport module to compute a pseudo route to cluster assignment uh, for training. Uh, so we we fit uh, both the prototype C and, and the feature Z into the temporal optimal transport module uh, to compute the pseudo label cluster assignment Q. For the temporal opt optimal transport module, uh, it imposes two constraints. The first constraint is that each cluster is assigned uh, an equal number of frames. And uh, for the second constraint, uh, it assumes that the temporal uh, order of the of the, the action is reserved. We then um, use the Ross entropy loss to minimize the difference between uh, the pseudo label cluster assignment and the related uh, cluster assignment. So as the training progress, um, the cluster C or the, 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 the cluster C uh, can capture the action um, of the activity. Did improve the pseudo label cluster assignment, which in turn uh, improved the prototype itself. For quantitative evaluation, uh, 
uh, our methods achieve significant uh, performance gain over uh, previous state-of-the-art uh, method. In particular, we achieve 12% uh, accuracy improvement and 3% uh, F1 score improvement. And uh, it can achieve this uh, while using three order of magnitude uh, less memory as compared to previous work. Here, uh, in the following, uh, I will show a few example uh, results of our unsupervised activity segment method. methods. Uh, the first one is on the breakfast data set. So in this, in this video, uh, the actor is making a sandwich. It has uh, only a, a handful of steps. Uh, in this example, uh, we can see that uh, our method can capture the action pretty well. The next example is on the YouTube instruction uh, video data set. This is a very, very uh, challenging data set um, because uh, the camera is moving and also there are a uh, lot of changes uh, in the appearance and the motion. Uh, despite all of that, our methods are uh, still able to capture some action uh, correctly, uh, which is quite encouraging, uh, given that the method learn uh, without any label and only from a handful of uh, video. The next example is on the desktop assembly data set. This is a long and multi-step activity. Uh, it has 23 actions. And in this example, um, our methods is able to capture uh, the accuracy, uh, the, uh, the, the action uh, relatively well. So in this uh, example, uh, we show our result on one um, manufacturing assembly video. At the top, you will see the original uh, input video. And at the bottom, uh, we show our predicted uh, segmentation uh, result by our unsupervised method. And uh, the red arrow show uh, the predicted uh, for the current frame. We note that uh, our method is able to capture the subtle change uh, between the step. Uh, lastly, uh, I will present our work, uh, our latest work on semi-supervised temporal activity segmentation, and this work is currently under submission. For fully uh, sup uh, for, for full supervision, uh, the labeler needs to specify uh, re the precise starting and ending frame for each action uh, in the training video, uh, and this can be uh, very time-consuming and expensive. In this work, we are exploring uh, a new form of uh, semi-supervised uh, learning, uh, which is called uh, timestamp supervision. Uh, in particular, for timestamp supervision, supervision, for each action, we uh, the, the, the labeler is uh, only need to specify one random frame, which is uh, much less work as compared to the full supervision setup. Here is uh, one uh, quantitative result uh, on the 50 data dataset. At the top, we show the result of the uh, step the uh, method uh, for uh, fully uh, su uh, supervised learning. And 
at, at, at the bottom, we show our result uh, as compared with uh, the related uh, methods on uh, time time supervision uh, for temporal activity segmentation. Uh, as we can see, our method uh, achieve better performance uh, than the, the state of the art method for time stamp supervision across all of the metric. And uh, the gap between uh, our method and the fully supervised methods is about 7%, uh, which is quite encouraging. This marks the end of my talk. Um, and I'm happy to take any question. Yeah, th thanks a lot, Dr. Tran, for the for the talk. Uh, before you know, to kick off the Q and A, I have one question: Is you you started the talk by saying that you're trying to help understand what humans are doing, right? Trying to assist humans in what they do, right? Trying to assist human manufacturing workers. You want to understand their individual steps. Is there any reason why the algorithms that you mentioned could couldn't be applied beyond humans to let's say to monitor a machine uh, that's do you know man, mechanical machine that's doing certain processes um i think it can still be applied to uh, a machine uh, because uh, our method is not model based uh, it it's used on the queue available in the images uh, so it, it doesn't rely on human pole detection uh, or something like that all right, thank you. Okay. Any other questions, folks? Uh, okay. Uh, if, if not, I'll, I'll hand it over to Jamal uh, for, to introduce the next speaker. Jamal. Thank you, Zishan. Um, our next uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Rahul Bodega, who is the Director for Computer Vision Research at AWS Amazon. Uh, Rahul team is responsible for delivering computer vision solution to all AWS customers. Uh, Rahul's team invent the algorithms and models that power AWS cloud-based computer vision services, uh, such as Amazon recognition services and text track. Rahul, we are very excited to have you today with us. Uh, with this, uh, I will give the floor to Rahul. All right. Thank you, Jamal. And thanks to all the organizers for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to present some of our work here. Uh, let me quickly share my screen and we'll get started. Okay. All right, thank you. So uh, today I'll talk about uh, what we call industrialization of computer vision. And there are two sort of related terms, right? Industrial AI, which is can be more specific to uh, sort of uh, businesses or users that have uh, assets. So social media tends to not be an industry in th that sense. Uh, but industry could be healthcare, it could be manufacturing and so on. And industrialization is the process sort of, of uh, uh, mechanization and uh, things like reliability and uh, robustness and so on uh, that become important when uh, your technology starts uh, getting used at uh, scale by many people. Uh, and of course, in the industrial manufacturing environment, industrialization is uh, sort of a necessary condition uh, for adoption. Uh, so, of course, uh, Amazon has a history of, uh, of uh, operating at scale, and not only in terms of the number of products, uh, the delivery, the number of users for things like Alexa, uh, and then expanding and saying, okay, it's not just trucks, but drones can also deliver, right, and so on. Uh, so there's already a lot of machine learning happening at scale within Amazon. Uh, for AWS, this also uh, is in terms of external customers who directly use some of the 
AWS services. Uh, and the point here is not that, hey, AWS has a lot of customers. The point I'm trying to make here is that each of these customers may have different uh, needs uh, and are operating themselves at a sort of a scale, right? So uh, that requires uh, machine learning to be a lot more robust. So how are we trying to, uh, at sort of a broad level, uh, service all of these uh, uh, use cases and uh, requirements? So you can think of this sort of a chart as four layers. So start from sort of the bottom layer is infrastructure and frameworks, right? Uh, so what we want to do is offer the broadest and deepest set of sort of hardware and infrastructure capabilities that enables machine learning researchers to build their models. So this could be frameworks like MXNet or PyTorch. It could also be containers in which you can sort of, uh, or notebooks in which you can do your work uh, and different types of hardware, right? So optimized CPUs, GPUs, and Amazon's own hardware like uh, Inferentia for uh, building fast applications. Uh, the next level is machine learning platform. Uh, which is if you are a machine learning developer as opposed to a software developer, then what are the tools that you need? Uh, what's the sort of the integrated development environment for you, uh, which we call SageMaker Studio. And then once you build the model, how do you actually uh, deploy it to production and continuously improve it, right? Uh, then the third layer is what we call AI services. So this is where you have uh, applications that are fully managed. So that means all like for computer vision, all you have to do is uh, bring an image or a video and you get answers. So you don't have to be a machine learning developer now, uh, but you, are, you could be the end user or you could be offering capability to your end users. Uh, and then in some cases, there's sort of a larger integration of their industries that require more work on top of the AI services and we call those solutions. So we have several offerings in sort of the manufacturing space or healthcare life sciences and so on. So moving on, in particular for the industrial segment, which I mentioned before, like where there's more assets, uh, there's a few sort of both a combination of hardware and software based services that are uh, available. Uh, so one is, let's say you have, you have a bunch of cameras on your site in a factory and uh, you require uh, fast, uh, turnaround time, or you don't have local bandwidth, but you don't have bandwidth to connect to the network and so on. So you could use something like the Panorama appliance. And what it does is it creates sort of a, a local hub where GPUs are available for you to deploy models and uh, connect your cameras and get outcomes. Uh, and similarly, we have uh, sensors for detecting uh, equipment failures or abnormal behavior. Uh, and an anomaly detection computer vision based uh, uh, service. So uh, before I get more into sort of the uh, core of the talk, just wanted to also give an overview of the type of services that are operating at scale uh, in computer vision in AWS. So Textract is an example of that. And this is not just OCR. Uh, so OCR would be extracting words and reading the characters in those words. Uh, but there's also a lot in terms of document structure that's lost when you create an image, but the image has a lot of information about the layout and so on. So we have built models that uh, allow you to not just extract the text, but also entities such as tables or relationships such as uh, uh, date of birth is month, date, year, and so on, right? Uh, and this is now becoming important because speaking of industrialization, uh, there's a lot of effort in terms of intelligent document processing, robotic process automation, where uh, billions of documents are being scanned and being converted into uh, more scalable representations in software instead of on paper. Uh, similarly, we have a set of uh, capabilities on what would be considered uh, sort of uh, more mainstream computer vision. Uh, in terms of recognizing objects, uh, moderating content, uh, uh, recognizing text in scenes as opposed to documents, uh, safety equipment recognition, face analysis, and so on. Uh, and then towards the bottom right, I'm also showing uh, uh, work that we are doing in terms of taking all of these models 
and not just offering the cloud services, but also where it makes sense offering an edge version of those. Uh, and these little icons here, actually what they mean is that uh, the reason for doing edge is that you might have a latency requirement. You might have bandwidth issues where you can't actually upload all of your data and get results back in a factory setting. Or you might have privacy requirements. So you, you want data to be sort of contained in your local environment and not uh, propagate on the cloud. Uh, so these are uh, some of the sort of the broad services. Uh, the way they are being used uh, is across different sort of industry segments. Here in gold or yellow, I have highlighted the ones that are particularly applicable for factory settings or manufacturings or enterprises that have physical presence. Uh, so taking a brief pause here, so once you have a computer vision deployed, you have many, many users, right? So you're not building one model that will be used by yourself or just one user. Of course, that also happens, right? Uh, but you have many users and some of these users might have many use cases. Some of these users might be uh, what you would call uh, not machine learning experts, but domain experts. So they know everything about their area, right? So let's say a biologist who's doing, using imaging to do experiments, uh, but doesn't necessarily know about machine learning. So how do you use a fully managed service, but give them the flexibility instead of what a machine learning platform would have, right, offer in terms of the things that they are able to do, right? Uh, and so then you should be able to not just take the set of services that I described earlier in terms of recognition and extract, but also adapt to the task that the user is bringing, right? Improve that model continuously over time, right? Uh, and while improving, make sure that uh, while accuracy is improving, it's still robust and reliable. So things that worked before don't stop working. Uh, and then as I mentioned before, scale across diverse use cases. So in the rest of the talk, I'll touch upon some of these, not all of them. Uh, and let's see, I have more slides than I have time. So we'll see how well I do. Uh, so sort of formally defining what we mean by diverse use cases, which cannot be, let's say some uh, a large number of users is interested in person detection, right? So that's what we would call head of the distribution. And you can build a single model or a single service, which can hopefully help uh, many customers or enable them to do their downstream task with person detection and so on. Uh, but at the same time, there are different other visual recognition uh, use cases where, which are specialized. And these use cases, we don't even have the data as AWS to build a service. And even if we had the data, we would not be able to operate thousands of different mini services for each of these uh, problems, right? Uh, and this is again, assuming that uh, the user is not a machine learning developer, so they need help, they can't do this on their own. Uh, so, uh, and these can be fine grained, these can be very specific. In a lot of cases, uh, you don't have enough data to actually uh, start with a decent model, but uh, which is labeled, but you may still have data, of course. Uh, another way the long tail sort of surfaces itself is in uh, just the imbalance in the data, both in the number of classes or subclasses, as well as the number of exemplars available for training. Uh, so you have to deal with this uh, both in a sort of a few shot setting and an imbalance setting. Uh, so for example, on the right, if you look at the iNaturalist data set, uh, monarch butterflies are very popular. So here on the top left, but you will get something like uh, uh, thousands of examples if you just scrape the internet uh, for monarch butterflies. Whereas some obscure beetles somewhere in the world might only have one or less than 10 examples. So how do you deal with this when users bring that kind of data to you. Uh, so one of the services that we have built that tries to address this problem is called custom labels. And uh, it includes the following sort of three things. So one is that you start with uh, an experience where you can actually in the system, label your images for whatever task you're interested in. Uh, and then as a user, you say, okay, I want to now train a model. So it's it, you can do it through a simple API or through a console experience. And if you're satisfied with the model performance, then as a user, you can actually deploy it and run it to in production at whatever scale you want to operate. Uh, 
So the benefits, like I said before, is this is a low code, no code experience, no ML expertise required. And you may have a lot of data that you want to process, but you have to, you can start with less label data uh, and then build it up. Uh, and then Amazon manages the whole of experience for you. So you don't also have to worry about uh, what GPU I need to get for training, how long do I need to run training and so on. So some of the use cases that are being uh, that are in production using custom labels are listed here. It uh, goes from agriculture to media to documents to uh, uh, even like finding animals in the wild to manage inventories in stores uh, and then of course for manufacturing. Uh, quickly jumping to some of the research challenges, I won't cover all of them today, but uh, we talked about the long tail and customers or users having different tasks, but how do you go from these very different tasks to the best model for that task for a particular user, right? So that's one problem we've been looking at. Uh, and then you could build a model, but then the user at some point might, either the first model is not good enough, or you might be trying to uh, improve it over time as you get data. And so how can we incorporate that feedback and improve models over time? Uh, some of the other areas that we have looked at, I won't be able to cover today, but of course it also requires research in few shot methods. Uh, even if you have sort of a base set of models and you're offering uh, ability to adapt to different tasks, you also want to continually learn and improve your base uh, models. Uh, and then, not make everything to be heavily or strongly supervised. So how do we look at methods where less label data is required or uh, the system can take data as a whole and learn from it? So one of the things we have done there is uh, to Im investigate what we call task embeddings. Uh, so think of like if given a set of images and some labels associated with the images, and then finally, some definition of what it means uh, to associate those labels and images. So sort of a broad loss. Then you could say that's the task definition. If you could convert it to a vector representation of some sorts, then you can ask very interesting questions, right? You can actually say, okay, if I have some space of tasks, then what are similar tasks? For a particular task, what architecture can I use, right? What optimization should I do? Uh, and so on. So uh, now today, typically when you take a new task and you have to build a model, either you, a scientist becomes like sort of the person who makes judgment calls about which model to use, or you can do it brute force, which is you can take all of your different architectures and uh, just train all the different classifiers and choose the best one, right? Uh, but with task embeddings, we feel that you can actually go in and given the task, first get that vector. From that vector, you can say, okay, which model? And maybe you don't choose one because uh, one may not be sufficient and so on. So you can say somewhere between, let's say three, five, 10, instead of thousands of classifiers, and then just train those selected models uh, for the particular data and give the best model. So how do we do that? So we take task embeddings as basically the Fisher information uh, of the statistics of, uh, of a network. So given a task, you can uh, take what we call a generic probe network, compute the gradients with respect to the label data, right? And then they use the statistics using Fisher information to create this task embedding representation. So now if you have a new task, you can create that embedding vector and you can have a library of models or architectures for which you have pre-computed all of your vectors. And so now you have a way of doing task similarity and picking the models that you want to further find. So this is, we want interest in more details. So that's our ICCV 2019 paper. Uh, and you can see that across a wide variety of tasks, uh, if you start with ImageNet and fine tune, uh, in general, uh, this task embedding approach actually outperforms uh, ImageNet. Uh, the other thing which we are very interested in is that it does better uh, when you present less data, right? So this could be both in sort of a fixed setting where you don't, you only update the classifier, you don't fine tune, 
or you actually take your model and fine tune with the data that the user is providing. But in either case, uh, you can see that uh, the task to vec model recommendation works better than taking ImageNet uh, broadly speaking. Okay, so uh, the next item that I wanted to talk about was uh, if you have a model and you want to improve it, how do you do that in a more efficient way? Uh, so our so hypothesis is that uh, customers have a lot of data, but very little of it is labeled. And if you leave it to the customer to decide what you needs to be labeled, then that takes a lot of insights, it takes a lot of work and it's hard. Instead, if you could train a model with whatever label data is available and then use the predictions, get feedback from the user directly, and then decide which one of those go back to the label data and retrain, we believe that you can do better, right? So we have actually shown that uh, in particular, we have developed a method called uh, linear quadratic fine tuning, which linearizes this process. Uh, and here in these graphs, you can see that uh, the relative increase in the error when you use LQF versus sort of standard fully connected fine tuning and so on, uh, there's a little bit of error increase. The, so the blue line, vertical line is sort of your standard nonlinear network. And these are different variations of uh, doing fine tuning on top of that uh, in a more linear sense. And LQF does well, it, the error goes up a little bit. Uh, but the learning rate using this approach is actually fast. That means it Im the model improves very quickly. And in the few shot setting, it actually outperforms uh, standard nonlinear methods. So, uh, so what does that enable? So instead of saying, okay, I need to relabel a bunch of data or add more data and take, I don't know, depends on your model, whether it tra retrains in four hours or it could take four days, uh, Instead of that, this becomes an interactive experience. And the user is constantly looking at predictions, labeling a few images, correcting the predictions, and instantly the model is improved in uh, almost real time. And then you can continue this process. So the process of model improvement now becomes interactive. And we have evaluated this on some public data set as well as some of our internal data sets. And this actually says that if you frequently update the model with small number of samples, eventually you need actually less overall data to achieve a certain model performance. And it's much more uh, intuitive to the users. So here's a quick demo <laughs> with uh, beer bottles of classifying beer brands. Uh, I'll jump across this. So let's say the task is that I have different sort of uh, beer bottles and I want to sort of classify by the brand. So the user would go in and say, okay, here are all my categories, label a little bit of data, build a first model. And then at some point they start reviewing the performance, right? And so they say, oh, this, uh, these, some of these are uh, here. This is really Heineken, but the system is calling Blue Moon as the first choice, Corona is the second choice, but why is all of them are wrong? So I'll fix them and remove the other ones, right? And instantly LQF now takes the, this input and you can see on the bottom left, it takes the test set and it basically retrains the model and shows the performance. And you can see the screen flashing. What is happening is that it's actually re-ranking the test set and showing examples to the user. And they keep repeating this process and error keeps going down. And this is a recording in real time, somewhat accelerated playing at 1.5X, but that's the kind of experience we would like to create for you. So at some point you can do, keep doing this and then your error is sort of down and up. And at that point you are basically done. You say, okay, that's the model that I want to use. So uh, one other area that I'll uh, mention briefly is uh, what we, uh, it's a very similar service to custom labels, but it's targeted for anomaly detection in end of line quality inspection. So in the previous talk, you were seeing some things about process inspection and defects in that. But once everything is done, before it goes out, products usually have a QA stage, which is called end, end of line inspection. Uh, and so we've taken the same idea of customizing tasks. Uh, the big difference here is that uh, you are looking for abnormalities. So in this case, you can actually start with just a definition of what is normal. So you don't require classes for abnormal. But if you add a few examples of what abnormal is, then the system actually learns from either just normal 
or a combination of a large number of normal images and a very small number of abnormal images. Uh, so again, many use cases, but we are building the same set of sort of uh, model zoo with model recommendation systems here uh, to take care of different tasks, right? Uh, so it's not just defects, but also absence presence uh, and uh, looking at uh, counting the number of defects, uh, is the material consistency changing and so on. And these are all examples either from public data sets or toy examples uh, here because uh, in manufacturing, it's really hard to show actual customer examples because of privacy reasons. Uh, one other thing we're doing is that uh, you can do anomaly classification, but customers also want to know where is the anomaly and they want to actually measure it, quantify it and so on, right? Uh, so now this problem of model selection, adapting to different tasks, doing it in a few short setting is also applicable to segmentation. Uh, so we have started to do this work. This is fairly new. Uh, and one of the things we realized is that, especially in a factory setting, you have to handle lighting variations. You have to make sure that you are actually augmenting the data for the anomalies, uh, because otherwise it will start marking everything as a possible uh, anomaly for segmentation. Uh, and then you have imbalance in the data because mostly things are normal and you have a few anomalies with segmentations provided to you. So we handle that through focal loss, et cetera. Uh, I can't unfortunately show examples of uh, industrial use cases there, again, for customer privacy, but we have taken the same models and applied it to uh, even healthcare use cases. So this is an example of results of this few shot anomaly segmentation method on digital retinopathy. This is a public data set, uh, and it's basically a multitask segmentation uh, problem where we have each of the colors actually represents different types of structures and anomalies that uh, that an ophthalmologist uh, wants to detect uh, in these images. Uh, so it does fairly well here. Uh, here's another example, which is, uh, uh, I'm, I apologize if it makes uh, some folks queasy, but this is an optical colonoscopy video. And so we have basically taken good frames from a bunch of videos. There's this public data set that's available for this uh, and applied our few shot anomaly segmentation method. Uh, and it does fairly well. You still need to do some work to smooth over the video because all the detections are being done on one frame. Uh, but then if I move forward, you will see that at some point, actually the lighting changes because they switch because they're trying to look at some contrast and what's going on. Uh, and the system still works uh, even with the, those drastic changes. Uh, and it tends to have a low number of uh, false positives uh, when there's actually things are clear, right? Or going through like there's water in the colon and stuff uh, that uh, it does okay with. Uh, the main thing that we found uh, going back to that was that uh, using this few shot method, and this is not a surprising result, that even with 50% of the training data, you can beat state of the art. And just with 10% of the data, you can get pretty close to the state of the art. Uh, and so the takeaway message there really is that uh, you can do a lot more with few shot methods if you design sort of your model library and do the right sort of model selection and so on. Uh, one open challenge which we have started to look at, but it's also uh, a question for, uh, for the folks here, is that there is there are some public benchmarks in this industrial space of anomaly localization and segmentation, but uh, things like MB Tech have really saturated. And so if you take state-of-the-art methods, they really give you baseline performance for real-world tasks. And so we have to go back and actually update those benchmarks. So we are in the process of uh, uh, actually creating these benchmarks and relate, uh, releasing them for the community. Uh, just as an example here, I show a simple example of uh, the, the top image is uh, normal, the middle image is abnormal, and then the last one is the zoomed in view. And MV Tech has these examples of like a little notch in the pill, while in reality, what our users are bringing to us are, here's a hundred pills in a pile, tell me what's going on before I pack them. And here, in, if I zoom in, there's one where there's a little bit of a leak happening in this environment, uh, and that's what we are supposed to detect. So we're trying to build new benchmarks that actually model these type of hardware use cases. Okay, 
Uh, I have about, I think, three, four minutes. So I'll quickly jump through uh, sort of the last part of the talk, which is once you have these models operating at scale, then there is an aspect of model management that also, which would you would consider practical, or you could say, oh, that's part of like sort of what a company does and so on. But there are research problems here that are pretty significant uh, that uh, we feel that the community should invest in. Uh, so one is backward compatibility. So let's say you have an embedding for a task like visual search, customers are using it, and then you update it to a better model, it could create uh, issues. And then uh, if, what if you have different compute environments, how are your models compatible or optimally compatible uh, across these? Uh, and when you have thousands of users, you can always have an improved model overall, which statistically will give you better performance, but some of those users might be unhappy because their use case stopped working. Uh, so these are three examples of research challenges we have started to look at uh, with uh, industrialized CV. Uh, so I talked about the search example. If you do a model update from V1 to V2, they become incompatible. And so you can't really sort of match your queries where the embedding is produced from a new model from your older gallery and compare. So you have to uh, develop methods that do cross compatible uh, search. And we have done that in our work in 2020, where you basically say that, okay, we'll take the new backbone but make sure that the new backbone's output is connected to the classifier of your previous model. And that influences the loss so that uh, this new model that you're learning, wherever data set is overlapping, it is able to get input. So it builds its own classifier, but it also is compatible with the previous classifier. Uh, similarly, if you take that same visual search example forward, uh, you also have the issue of indexing your data in the cloud, but then you are running it on the edge. And of course, you can always recompile. There are several methods to take a model and compile it, but that necessarily doesn't give you the best answer. So you have to make a hard trade-off between uh, accuracy and efficiency, right? Uh, and so this sort of uh, heterogeneity between the indexing model and the query model, uh, what we have done is taken the backward compatibility concept and incorporated it into neural architecture search so that your edge model is not only compatible, but also gives the best possible performance. Uh, and so in this paper at CEPR 2021, we have shown that as compared to sort of popular networks, our method called CompNAS does the best, uh, and it actually runs on the edge 30X faster, but only loses 1.6% in accuracy on average across our use cases. Uh, and the last problem here, is when you update a classifier, in general, it could get better. So in ca this case, there are seven uh, uh, test samples and the first classifier does well on three, the new classifier does well on four. So overall accuracy improves, but one of these flipped. And so the user who cares for that is now going to be upset with us saying, you said you have a better model, but it works uh, worse for us. Uh, and so again, during training, you can actually put constraints in, uh, which we call focal distillation, to make sure that on your test sets at least, the new model is always improving across use cases while improving accuracy. And the other result that we have is that if you use ensembles instead of a single model for your first network, and then when you improve it, then going from ensembles to ensembles with this focal distillation actually lets you cut the negative flip rate down quite a bit without uh, uh, affecting uh, much of your overall accuracy. Okay, so I'll stop here. And uh, the main message is that interesting new problems are coming up as uh, computer vision operates at scale with many users, uh, especially on the factory floor. All right, thank you. Thank you, Rahul. Uh, really interesting talk there. Um, we actually have time for one question. Uh, uh, we have a question here from Khurram. Uh, what is the acceptable level of accuracy for clients from the industry that you work with usually? For example, related to anomaly detection. Yeah, so that's a great question. It varies. And I think uh, 
you will see that it, it depends also whether in some cases precision is important or recall, right? So uh, if you are on, in social media and you want to find every all people that are in your videos, you need to have good precision, but recall may be a little bit low, because you can still get by, same for products, such and stuff. In the anomaly space, of course, what we have found is that uh, uh, customers go through two stages. One is where they do sort of a proof of concept and they want performance to be north of 90% in general, uh, both in precision and recall. Uh, it's That's important because of course, recall, you don't want to miss the defects, but if you identify too many things, then, uh, it adds so much work that it makes for a process that cannot be used uh, in production. Um, and then after the POC is done, then they actually start doing scale experiments and it depends on what quality rate they are able to qualify. In general, the view is that you should be able to take uh, your average quality inspector and make them an expert inspector. So uh, before I joined Amazon, I worked at GE and in a lot of use cases for GE in aviation and healthcare and stuff, inspection usually required 99% or more for the expert. Uh, and then the average quality inspector was at 95% or so typically. Uh, so if you can have that sort of bridge that gap and improve, then it actually is usable. Thank you, Raul. Very interesting talk. Uh, thanks again. And uh, if you have more questions, we can forward that to you. Um, right. Thank, thank you. you. Um, our uh, next speaker is Dr. Cordelia Schmidt, uh, who is well known in the computer vision community. Uh, she is the director for research in India, Paris. Uh, she was recently also awarded uh, the 2021 PAMI Distinguished Researcher Award. Uh, we are very excited to have you today with us, uh, Dr. Sh Dr. Schmidt. Uh, with this, I will give the floor to the floor to Dr. Cordelia Schmidt. Thank you very much. Let me try to share my screen. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see that. Is it in full mode? Uh, nope, it's not in the full mode. Right, maybe something is wrong. Let me stop sharing. Let me try again. What about now? We see it in the full mode now. Thank you. Okay, okay, great. Thank you so much. Right, I'll talk about some recent results on action recognition in videos. So automatic video understanding either requires classification of short clips, such as answering phones or handshaking, but then more importantly, in applications such as self-driving cars or video surveillance, we want to localize the humans and understand their behavior. So for example, in, in the example on the right, you want to determine that the human is crossing the road. And in the video surveillance scenario, you want to see when and where people are doing suspicious behavior. In the content of manufacturing and automatic understanding of the factory floor, we want to understand activities what kind of actions people are doing, is the action performed correctly? And we also want to navigate around the factory floor, which is similar to problems in understanding of autonomous driving. In the following, I will present some of our recent work on spatial temporal action localization, and then conclude with recent work for action classification with the video vision transformer. In order to precisely understand the actions, we have to localize the actors in space and time precisely. For example, we want to know where which person is drinking and at which moment in time in the video. Or similarly, we want to determine when and for how long the child is brushing his teeth and which child is brushing the teeth. To do so, we have to localize action tuplets and determine the classification for them. Furthermore, actions can be ambiguous if only one frame is absorbed. For example, here, 
we cannot say if the person is sitting down or standing up. However, if we look at several frames, we can see that in the top, the person is sitting down, and in the bottom, the person is standing up. What we want to do is we start off by anchor cuboids in videos, similarly to object boxes in images. We then want to determine what's the spatial and temporal extent over time and classify the action performed in the anchor box. To do so, we want to have a score for the anchor box, but we all, for the anchor cuboid, but we also want to regress the tubelets, that is to deform the cuboid, the cuboid to adapt to the shape of the actor in the video. The approach here applies the same detector with shared weights here based on the SSP detector to each frame over a temporal extent. We can then combine the responses of the different layers in the SSD de detector over space and time and feed them into one classifier, which classifies them jointly and regresses the reply in each frame separately. This means we get a set, set of classification scores. We have C classes, C classification scores, and we regress the box in each frame jointly, but we obtain a more precise regress location in each frame. This means from a cuboid, from an cuboid, we can go to a regressed localization. And if you look here at this video, in green, the ground of detections, in yellow, the correct detections, we can see here that not only do we classify the action correctly as riding horse, here, long jumping and so forth, but we also localize the actor precisely in the video. Here another example, again, it's relatively easy to determine that the person is skiing, but here we really want to localize the precise skiing position and here even more importantly and more difficultly, the localization of the diver it is really a difficult problem, and if you just apply tracking, it would be much harder. While if you use our tubelet approach, it manages to follow the actor correctly through the video. <laughs> to conclude, two failure cases. Here, the actors localize correctly, or the, or the space, the temporal extent is not. And the second example, where we have two people uh, ice skating together, you can see that we don't manage to localize both people correctly and, and model the interaction between the two. To do so, we have introduced an additional component which models the spatial and temporal relations within the frame. So instead of just modeling the, the box, the spatial box for one actor, we also model the relation between other objects. If you look in more detail at the failure modes, the first one is a false answer for handshake. It is really reaching out the arm, but given that we don't see the other person and don't model the interaction with the other, with the other person, we cannot determine that the other person is not reaching out the arm. The second example is a false answer for smoke. The hand is covering the mouth, but there is no hand, cigarette in the hand. To model these interactions, we not only model the humans, but we also model the objects in the environment. So what we do is we have a set of actor tubelets and model by relations in the actions with the environment. The output we are having is then the actor is talking and holding an object. So not only do we determine the action of the actor, but we can also see that the actor is holding an object. To do so, we construct tubelets on the appearance similarity of the actors. This is done with the Siamese network and a triplet loss. And this, and we can then combine the features in the tubelet with the graph convolutional network, which allows the model the sequence of actions in the tubelet. 
Furthermore, we model the relations between the human and the objects in the environment. We rely on soft assignment to integrate the features. We can see here that by adding this sample relation learning, we go from an incorrect label here, sit, to the correct label and a precise way of following the actor in the sequence. Similarly, if we look at what does the relational modeling do, we can see here on the left, the baseline approach <coughs> models the action as hold. But if we then look at the objects in the environment, we can then see that the, the action is modeled correctly as eat, as we take into account the fork. We can also use this kind of relational modeling for action forecasting. This is to go one step forward further and not only say what the current action is, but predict what the person is going to do in the future. So for example, here, should I wait or should I, can I cross this, the road? Or the other example, is the girl going to fall down the stairs or not? A couple of more examples. The people on the left are sitting and talking. And then we can predict by giving the fact that we see the glasses in the video that they're going to next clink the glasses. The example in the middle, somebody is holding, is holding something and standing, and the next action is serving the packet. To do so, we take into account the past and present observation and predict the future. And to do this, we have a set of actor, actor proposals, which are humans localized in the sequence and the surrounding feature network. And we then model with the graph neural network, the relations and the, the, the temporal attention in the future. We look here, we have a video up to frame T and we forecast the action eat. You can see here that the action is correctly forecasted. If you look at the second example, we can forecast the action get up. And we can see here that the correct action is forecasted. Two more examples, we have video up to frame T. We can then forecast that the next thing the person is going to do is person is going to read and on the bottom person is walking towards the door and we can then forecast by modeling the interactions between the person and the door that the next action is opening the door. And here are two failure cases. We can forecast here the, the action which is forecast is getting up. But in reality it's a wrong duration. The person is not is, is proposing, but the next thing he's getting is he's not getting up, but he's still sitting. So the duration is wrong here. And then the second failure case is somebody, you can see that there's a door half open and actually there are multiple, the prediction is closing the door, but there are actually multiple futures. And instead of closing the door, they're opening the door. But given that the previous action is not completely clear, we, are, we have these multiple futures and cannot predict correctly the subsequent actions. So this means actually that if we do action predictions in many cases, we should not only predict one possible future, but we should predict multiple possible futures with possible probabilities. And we can then extend this action forecast to behavior predictions for self-driving cars. In the context of self-driving cars, one important problem is the prediction of the intent of a vehicle. It requires to understand the scene and then dynamically predict the behavior of the vehicle. So here you can see the other cars in blue which are moving around in the scene and what we want to predict is that the, the car in white is going to turn left. We're going to see if this is possible or if it's going to hit into other cars. This is a classical problem in self-driving car, but it could also be used in factories if you have robots moving around the factory. Both approaches represent the environment 
the high by definition map and the agents moving around in the image as images and encode them with convolutional networks. This is costly in compute and memory. And it's also challenging due to the long range geometry. So if you only have images, it's impossible to model or it's difficult to model the long range geometry. We have therefore introduced the approach VectorNet in which maps and agents are vectorized and we then model the relation between these vectors. And the relations, they're actually modeled at two layers, levels. The first level models locally each object as a set of vectors, and represents them as polylines. And the polyline is represented by a graph connecting its vector. So crosswork, for example, you would have a set of vectors which are connected by a polyline subgraph. And here we use a graph neural network to connect the vectors and encode it with multi-layer perceptrons. So this is our first layer where we capture and model the local components. We then put a second global interaction graph on top of this, which models the interactions between the different sets of input vectors. So we model the relation between the crosswalk, the lane, and the agent. So each of them is represented by vectors. Some of them move and other don't. And the global interaction graph models the exchange of information among the polylines. It's fully connected and implemented with self-attention. For training, we have we rely on supervised training, which is based on a large large number of example sequences. So if you have cars driving around, we have a very large number of example sequences, which we can then use to train our system. We rely on two complementary losses. The first one is the L1 loss for target trajectory prediction. So we have a trajectory up to time t, and we would predict the future trajectory data points and use L1 to compare the future with the predicted ones. We also use map completion loss, that is, we map out nodes in our fully connected graph and then use masking loss to map them out and predict them. This further stabilizes the structure of our graph network. For experimentation, we rely on the Argo mode, Argoverse motion forecasting data set. It contains approximately 300,000 five second long sequences. It includes vehicle trajectories and map information. We use from zero to two seconds as observation and then predict from two to five seconds the future. And the observed trajectories are obtained with an automatic perception system and are thus noisy. As metrics, we use standard metrics, which are the average displacement vector error in meters computed over the entire predicted trajectory, and the displacement, displacement error at t in meters when we're at one, two, and three seconds. If we now look at an ablation of the context information and the training objectives. Simplest prediction is obtained with just L1 loss. You can see that the displacement error at three seconds, in this case, is more than five meters. If we add map information and other vehicles, it goes down substantially. And then if we add our map completion loss, we can see that it goes down further which means that this additional loss actually helps to improve our training procedure, which is interesting. <clears throat> if you compare our res results to convolutional network, the ResNet 18 architecture, you can see that our approach is much faster, uses less parameters, and obtains better results than a traditional approach based on con convolutional neural network. So we have, in more detail, 20% of the compute when there are 50 agents per scene, 29% of the parameters, and 18% better performance. If compared to the state of the art on the leaderboard test set for the most likely 
trajectory, we can see that our approach outperforms the state of the art. And finally, I'll present some recent work on video vision transformers. Transformers have shown state of the art performance for a number of problems in computer vision. In particular, the VIT transformer has shown state of the art classification performance for static videos, for static images. Here, we extend this approach to videos. Furthermore, to handle a large number of tokens, we explore more efficient factorized attention variants. If you look at the illustration below, we can see that our approach takes as input a video. It embeds the video to tokens. I'll say in a minute how to do this. And then each token is transformed linearly and we have a token embedding, which can be associated with the convolution. And then we add the position information. We then have a set of tokens as you would have for an image, but here it's tokens for video. And then we can use a transformer in code to model the relation between the different tokens. We have an MLP head and obtain a class for the given video. In order to encode the video, we rely on a tubelet embedding. So we extract 3D spatial temporal tubelets and linearly project them into tokens. Each, to each tubelet spans spans a spatial extent a patch as would be in images but then also has a temple extent and then the spatial temple tubelet is linearly projected to a token and this captures the temple information in the tokenization stage and it works better than simple uniform sampling next we then once we have projected these tubelets into tokens we can then train a standard transformer on top of it. However, this is quadratic in the complexity of the tokens. While this is feasible for images, it's much more difficult for videos. And so we have introduced a factorized encoder, which separates the encoder for the spatial and temporal information. So we first encode each image, the spatial encoder, and then we have on top of this a temporal transformer which we then feed into our MLP head, and this obtains the class information. This is a late fusion of the spatial and temporal information. However, during training, the whole model is learned end to end. If we compare the different variants, we can see that the model one, the spatial temporal encoder on the different data sets obtains state of the art performance. If we now use our factorized encoder, we lose a bit of precision on the Kinetics 400 data set. This is due to the fact that our model is slightly less powerful. If you look on the, result, on the results on the Epic Kitchen data set, the results are actually slightly better. And this is due to the fact that the data set is much smaller and it's actually difficult to train a large complex network. What's interesting is the runtime. If we compare the runtime of our model one and two, we can actually see that the factorized encoder is much faster as we don't have the quadratic complexity or we rather we break it down into the complexity for images and then for videos. Now the thing which is interesting, we compare to an average pooling baseline our model two. So instead of having the temple encoder on top of the image features, what we have here, we have a pooling baseline which combines the features. And then if you compare our results to the state of the art, you can see that A, our approach outperforms the state of the art. What's important is basically the size of the network. So we have a huge transformer, which is really huge down here. The results are significantly better than for large transformer. And if you look, on the pre-training, you can also see that large-scale pre-training improves the performance significantly. Here, the pre-training is for the image features, which are then inputted into the video transformer. And then similarly, 
for kinetics 600, we can make the same observation. We can see that our approach outperforms state of the art. The huge model is better than large. And the pre training helps significantly. You can also see that by having a higher input resolution, our performance also improves significantly. In conclusion, we have seen that we now can obtain excellent results for action recognition and behavior prediction. So in many contexts, these kind of methods are now ready to deploy it, in particular, if you're dealing with restricted scenarios, as would be the case, for example, in for manufacturing. So there we could really imagine that we're able to model our environment precisely. We can then use state-of-the-art techniques to navigate around the environment correctly. We have seen that we now have more models which take into account spatial and temporal relations in different ways, but in all, in all the cases, either by modeling the interactions between humans and objects explicitly, or by modeling the relations between vehicles and their surrounding environment explicitly, or in the last example, where we model the relations between the patches in a video. Automatically, we've all seen that these kind of models help to improve the performance. And we have seen that these sophisticated models based on graph convolutions and self-attention significantly outperform the state of the art. The next steps are to integrate furthermore the relations in a more tight manner and not only output the classification scores from the transformer, but output the individual objects, their relations and their interactions. So to have a fully end-to-end -end trainable model, which takes as input videos and as outputs classifications, actions and actors fully automatically. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for the very interesting talk. Um, we do have a few questions here and we have a few minutes. Uh, so the first question I'm seeing in is from uh, Zishan and the question is, which GPU are the transformer timings evaluated on? Oh, it was, there was, the timings were in flops, so it wasn't specific GPU, right? So it's all in flops. Okay, thank you. Um, then we have another question from uh, Huram. Uh, for your work relating to vision transformer in your experiments, was there any analysis showing for which actions and activities does the model work well and which ones does it perform poorly? So you're specifically relating to the vision transformer, right? To the last part of my talk. So there we found that it works well for, op for actions with a lot of motion, right? So basically, if there's almost no motion, then it's not necessary to model the, the action with a vision transformer. So for example, where it worked best was for the something something data set where there's a lot of activity in motion. And so there we get the most gain over like average polling, for example. I see. Uh, and then we have another question from Rajiv. Uh, how will the model deal with rotational invariance in uh, your experiments? So there's no inbuilt rotational invariance, right? So this is something I guess all the state-of-the-art approaches currently, they don't really have inbuilt rotational invariance. So what you can do is you can do old data augmentation to build in rotational invariance, but currently there is no inbuilt rotational invariance basically. Let's see. Um... Do we have any more questions? Looks like uh, these are all the questions we have. Uh, uh, I want to thank you again, uh, Dr. Cordelia. I think there was, one, there was one more question actually for behavior prediction. Have you tried your method with multi-person activities, right? Yes, uh, it, it is my question. Uh, yeah, so we have actually to answer it, we have. Haven't, we haven't tried it, so we're only always localizing on one 
object, but I think it would be very interesting. I think this is something for the future, right? As I said, basically now what we want to do next is to, for example, analyze football games, analyze multi-person activities where we can really model and not have heuristics, right? We could obviously apply it to several people and then kind of put the model on top of it. But what, what we would want to do is to really completely automatically model the interactions. And this is something, I think what I meant for the next steps is to really see how we can integrate, have an integrated model, not do it all on, one on top of each other, but really integrate it into one transform approach. So yeah. this is actually an interesting question. It's actually things which we want to do for future work, so. Thank you. Uh, there's also another question from Ovas. Um, are the state-of-the-art action recognition models able to track of able to track long temporal actions and keep track of the prior and posterior steps? Yeah, I would say currently not not, right? I mean they're they kind of can track if the conditions are well favorable, but currently I think this is like the open steps is like multi multi actors models and then how to model long range dependencies, right? For now, and it's also a problem with the data sets, right? For now, all the data sets, they're pretty short. It's short clips, but there are no data sets which go to its really long-term temporal dependencies, actually. All right, if uh, we, uh, uh, at this point, I, I'll respect the time from the speakers and of the audience. Uh, I want to thank, uh, thank you, Dr. Koteria Schmidt for the very interesting talk. And uh, at the end, I want to thank all the speakers and the audience here. Uh, we had some very interesting discussions uh, on diverse aspects of computer vision for factory floor and of the technologies that are being recently uh, developed. Uh, I hope there was a lot of learning for us. Uh, have a good rest of the Sunday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thanks a lot. Bye. -bye.